Good afternoon. Welcome to the Glendale Water and Power Commission meeting. Today is May 4th. Can I please have roll call? Uh, before I proceed, um, Commissioner Camargo will not be present. Uh, um, Commissioner Jemian? Present. Uh, Commissioner Yao? Present. Commissioner Hale, who's running 10 minutes. And President Chan? Present. Next item, please. Two consent items. A, approval of the, me uh, the meeting minutes on April 6th. Uh, I was not here last month, so we only have two commissioners present here. How should we handle that? Um, President Chan, you may still approve the minutes if you so choose, or you can continue it till next month. It's, it's okay. Uh, your pleasure. I, I read them. I don't have any issues or uh, requests to, for changes. How about the two of you? Yeah, I don't have any changes. No? Okay. So can I just go ahead and uh, move With to approve no that? objections, the minutes stand approved. Okay, please. Next item, please. Next item is three GWP Commission staff comments. I don't. You guys have comments? No? Okay. Um, I read over the minutes and it was a very full meeting la last month, I understand. And um, I, it seems like a lot of things got done and I look forward to hearing more today. I understand, you know, there, there are more, um, quite a few things being covered today. Uh, okay, uh, next item, please. Or's reports, A, the 2015-16 GWP budget interview, Stephen Zern. For the presentation. Uh, and see if it comes up. If not, I think you all have a hard copy and we'll just yes. do it the old fashioned way. Unfortunately, okay. the viewers won't see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, while we're waiting, I do have a request here to speak, and it says agenda item 3B. Um, miss, yeah, from Mr. Larry Morehouse. That's really 4B, right? Okay, yeah. I'm going to change that. Okay. You, We're ready. Should be. If not, it will be by tomorrow morning. Here we go. Madam President, members of the commission. Um, we are presenting you today with the draft uh, budget for fiscal year 2015-16. I apologize if my voice is a little scratchy and I'm going through a cold, so bear with me. Sneezing fits, coughing fits, I'll try to avoid all of those for you. Um, so if we go to the next slide, what you see here is what we call our dashboard, which kind of just encapsulates the main components of the budget, including the breakdown of the, um, the appropriations along with a breakdown of our, our general staffing categories being executive management, non-management, and hourly. And then we, we traditionally will put up there, uh, these are the KPIs that uh, we have been going through the last couple of years, and we put up some of the, what we think are the, the big items. Again, a, as we call it, a dashboard. So you can see for the projected fiscal year, we are, uh, looking at a budget, a total budget of $340,389,670. And that breaks down into just um, over 30 or 29 million in salaries and benefits, which is approximately 10%, I believe it's a little less than 10% of the total budget, which keeps us in line with what industry standard is in the utility. Actually, anywhere from 12 to 15% is generally where you see utilities with regards to salaries and benefits in regard to their total budget. So we've done a very good job in that regard. Our M&O budget, the largest component of our budget is, is nearly $260 million. That includes all of our operational necessities in each of our divisions, so water, electric, <coughs> power plant. It also includes primarily a big chunk of that is the purchase of, of electricity and gas on the open market through established contracts. 
uh, for day-to-day -day electrical needs in the city of Glendale. And then capital outlay, these are generally equipment items, rolling stock, uh, tools, testing equipment, that type of thing. Uh, and then capital improvement, <coughs> major construction components in our water, power, and electric distribution operations. That 50 million, as you well know, is still um, bond proceeds. We're still spending bond proceeds from water and electric that were approved by the council in previous years. So that number is, is continuing as we maintain and upgrade the critical infrastructure of our utility. <clears throat> and then you see over on the personnel side our breakdown. So we've again kept our management employees well under 10% of our total uh, employee outlook there. We've done uh, a lot of reducing the last three years. So that's almost 100 positions lower than we were four years ago. Uh, and we certainly have a lot of those reductions have taken place in the management ranks. Uh, and then our non-management making up the core of our, our staffing. And then, as I mentioned, we have a variety of just a cross-section, if you will, of some of our KPIs for, for this year. Mr. Zoe, may I ask, what, who are the management employees? What level are they? Are they managers and above? Is that what you, what you consider? Mid-managers and, mid -managers and above. Mid-managers and above. Correct. So generally, if you're looking at a field-level operation, it's a field supervisor up. Uh, in an engineering operation, we've got a certain classification of engineer. Usually it gets into a, what's called an engineer two. That's mid-management and above. All the way up to senior, principal, um, the AGMs, myself. So if you have a, um, an entry-level engineer, that person wouldn't be considered management. Though. That is correct. Uh, any of those employees belong to IBEW? Uh, the, in the non-management category, all of the field operations in water, electric, and power are members of IBEW. Okay. But and we also have some of the water treatment folks that are, that are involved there as well. The engineers, clerical staff, they are not. They are in, okay. under the GCA if they're non-management and under the GMA if they're management. And so the, these 21 are not in IBEW? That's correct. They would be GMA. GMA. Okay. Correct. Thanks. Next slide. Looking forward to 1516, we have our, our 1415 strategic goals that are set uh, with the city manager and myself. We've done very well the last two years on these. Um, our primary goal this year was to retain the OE, the owner's engineer, and complete the IRP, and you're going to hear that report today. Uh, implement the pilot <coughs> phase of the OMS outage management and the distribution management system, which has been completed. Close out our Department of Energy grant from way back when we, uh, when we got our $20 million for the automated and modernization upgrades. And we're, we are in the process right now of finalizing that paperwork. Literally, I think it's within a week. Uh, I think we'd like a little, little bit longer, but I think it's going to happen <laughs> within a week. Um, at the field level is our continued conversion of our feeders from 4 kV to 12 kV. That's been completed, and then, as you all know, we revised our strategic plan for GWB, GWP and completed that. We've made that presentation to you in the past. Looking ahead to 2015, 16, this is right out of our strategic plan, the revised strategic plan. So these are our main goals for, for next year. So that's to, to reduce technical and non-technical electric, electrical system losses to below 6%. We, as I've, I think, mentioned to you before, we feel we're a little high in our electrical loss, uh, which could be anything from straight loss over uh, inefficient infrastructure. It could be theft. Or, uh, those would be the primary uh, basis for that. So if you go back up to the goals that, that for this current fiscal year, you see that 4 kV to 12 kV, that's a critical component in increasing and, and improving our efficiency. And, and you reduce a tremendous amount of loss there. So we're hoping that begins to catch up. Plus, with our various uh, modernization efforts and, and automation, we hope to uh, reduce that, be able to see a lot sooner where we have anomalies, which could be theft, which could be illegal hookups, could be those type of things, and allow us to get to it quicker. And that's all part of the automation, the modernization, the metering system that we have in place. Um, we want to have fully, fully automate 35% of our GW feeders by 2020. Currently, we're about Ramon. Where are we to come on up? So just so you get a feel for, we want to fully automate 35%. Where are we today? 
Uh, currently we have, we're probably at about 17, 18%, close to 20% of conversion. The goal is by 2027, although it's saying 35% by 2020, those are distinct feeders, but one of the things that we've implemented is every time we touch a feeder is we, we want to touch it once, so we go ahead and reconduct them, re-insulate them. So although they're not converted, they've been reconstructed. So, okay. Perfect. Third bullet is in our, is our water operations, and that's to um, upgrade our system facilities to automate pumps to reduce energy costs. So we're looking at all of the components in our water system that use electricity and, and looking for ways that we can conserve energy in our water um, distribution, storage, and, and delivery system. Also, we want to optimize our storage by December 2017. We'll be taking on that, that particular goal in earnest uh, this upcoming year. And that's a total review of our storage systems, looking at where we may have inefficiencies, where we can change some of our longstanding policies with regards to storage. It's a good opportunity for us to likely store less water than we currently do. Um, but this is a major undertaking. It will be quite a change in how philosophically and operationally we've done things in the past. But I think notwithstanding the drought, it's an important item that we need to, to address. And then we want to finish the, the development of the water master plan. Fortunately, as it came to my attention, we've never had a true water master plan in, in water and power, and that's just necessary. It's the planning tool for going forward, primarily for your infrastructure, but I think it's very, very necessary. When I was in my previous life in public works, we were already starting our second 10-year wastewater and stormwater master plan, and those tools are vital, especially as you plan for um, where you have segments of the community that are changing greatly from when, from when infrastructure systems were originally put in. Is population changing? Is use changing? Is those kind of things, and it allows you to be able to better fine tune your, your capital program. Uh, and I think it's really, really important so that we're not just sort of, you know, uh, hit and miss on, on what we want to do. We can replace lines and lines and pump stations and all the infrastructure, but we want to make sure we're targeting the most need in the community where our future, immediate future, is going to be hit. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's the breakdown of the, each of the operations. So you see primarily electric, uh, and the electric utility, I say this is all the, the city utility, but that is primarily electrical distribution <coughs> and the power plant. That's where a majority of the budget is. You can see that we are proposing a $17 million reduction as we continue to lean out our operations, take a very austere approach to how we run things. Same with the water utility, almost a 15, almost a 16, excuse me, million dollar drop in our operational budget. <coughs> and public benefit charge is about this. We've actually increased that. Of course, that's the energy conservation component. Steve, I've got a question. Um, is that reflective of a revenue decline, or is that reflective of a operational decision by the utility to? That's an operational decision. Okay. Revenue, as you know, and we can talk a little bit about the water because the drought has impacted that, but revenue under the, 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 rate, the new rate structures for each is, is actually climbing as, as we rebuild our reserves and put money into uh, a PAYGO capital system. So that decrease uh, in both sides of the utility is reflective of an increase in the operating reserve and in um, not doing as much debt financing for, for operations, correct? Well, correct. We, I mean, we, we have outstanding bonds, obviously. Sure. We have past debt financing. The objective is, is that when we get to a certain point, we're going to be able to, to use the PAYGO system, not have to debt finance right. our, our what I call our annual routine upgrades and maintenance needs. Okay. So we've been able to continue to go through and look for efficiencies <clears throat> within the operation. Uh, uh, some of that may reflect where we had some large capital <clears throat> programs that we've backed up on. The electrical utility especially, we've reevaluated some of the power plant based on the IRP and uh, what the future may hold for the repowering of Grayson. So we've been able to 
to, to gain some efficiencies there. And, and as I said, there's a slight increase in the public benefit fund, and that's, again, where we do things like subsidize rates for certain categories, seniors and, and economically disadvantaged. Um, we use that for energy conservation programs. So that's, that's set aside with very specific funding or very specific uses. So it's not a bad thing to see that increase because that means we're going after more modernization and efficiency programs. Um, I have a question as well. Um, I understand, um, the, so the operating budget is lower. Now, um, from what I can remember, on our um, power and uh, both and uh, water rates, we had a multi-year budget that Correct. was approved. How does this impact that? This budget mirrors the COSA, the pro forma. Okay. So, so we wanted to mirror that pro forma and COSA. When we made that projection okay. out for four or five years, that's yes. what we're That was included? Yes. Okay. That's what I want to hear. Thank you. So, Mrs. Zhang, I have a question. I was going to save it to the end. But I noticed the, uh, the presentation throughout doesn't compare, even though this slides compare the, uh, oh, the previous slide I meant, compared <coughs> the previous adopted budget versus the proposed budget, and, of course, there's a great reduction for the rates. But on the previous slide, in slide two, where you mentioned sal salaries and benefits, O&M costs, capital outlays, and capital improvement, there's no comparison to what was... Um, requested last year, so it's kind of hard to follow, even like two years ago. So it would be nice to compare that, and then when you go to your recent slide on slide four, where the, we see the $17 million increase in electric rate, in electric utility, and $15.8 million decrease to the water utility, then it would be nice to see where those net $32 million are coming from. You mentioned it's going to be an operational efficiency, so is that mainly and reduce capital improvements or reduce salaries and benefits because you have more, less people now? Or how does the um, reduction compare to those different categories in slide two in terms of salaries and benefits, O&M, capital outlay, and capital improvements? Most of it is in the operational budget. Our, our salaries and benefits have been reduced quite a bit already, and we don't want to touch the capital improvement fund. I think, so I, I think I've said that many times up here to the point that we want to do that. So when I say operational efficiencies, that's day-to-day -day operational issues to the point where we can buy and sell power at a reduced cost to us, where we are able to enter into uh, beneficial long-term contracts like the one we did with Skyler on the, on the, on the solar purchase or the, the renewable purchase. That assists us. We're able to sell off some of our coal assets and make some revenue for the, for the department. So most of that's in the M&O. Maintenance and operation budget. So if we were to keep the same budget as, as was adopted last year and apply the rate increases that was adopted by the city council, wouldn't the excess fund from this go into a, the excess reserve fund so that in the future we can draw upon that fund for additional capital improvements, for example? It is. That, that's why we put the COSA together the way we did and the pro forma was done the way it was. If you recall, our goal is to rebuild our reserves in the electric to $110 million and to try to get it to hopefully $6 million in water. That's all part of the long-term rate structure plan. Okay. So this is the financing mechanism that went in there year by year. So I'm not deviating from that. That's what we said it would be in the COSA. That's what we based the rate increase on. If we need to cut more in order to make that, we will. So that money, any excess, does go back into reserves as we build our reserves up. And then, as you recall, in both the rates, it was the outlying years, the final two years, where the bond proceeds had been expended. And we went into what I called PAYGO capital. That's our reserve money paying for our ongoing necessary capital needs to, to the tune of about $25, $30 million in electric per year, probably closer to something like 7 a year in water. The reduction doesn't impact our rates or customers or reserves? The budget is mirroring the, the cost of service analysis. So, Steve, if, if I could jump in, um, what I'd like to actually request uh, after Council adopts a budget for, mm -hmm. for GWP is for you to put a schedule together that sort of lists the total revenues that we're getting and then what we're budgeting and then where that sort of outline where that $17 million cut in electric and $15 million cut in water are coming from. As compared to the fourteen fifteen mm -hmm. budget year, okay. So if we could if we could get that at the next meeting after after the budget. we'll send you something out. That's not a problem. That would work too. Yeah, thank you. Next. <clears throat> so this is a the fund recap for each of the operations. 
So here's where you see the difference. Um, if you go back, it's not on this slide, but if you were to go back, you would see the, um, <coughs> it was the very, this one. No, no, to the dashboard slide. By two. Two. One more. Okay. It's, can you toggle back and forth, or so we'll put these side by side and send those to you so you can see. On the salaries and benefits, there may be some additional costs that we haven't been identified, depending on if there are any changes to labor contracts. But those were also built into the COSA, so it won't deviate from the the cost of service analysis. Again, it could it could see this number change. But anything that was, and there's very few things, that was one that was an unknown because we're still dis in discussions. We didn't, uh, we didn't include it. It just, it just has been built into the COSA. Um, excuse me. Why is it that these n numbers don't match your slide two again? I think you were trying to explain that earlier. No, slide two was, so if you're, you're looking at the total budget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The 340 million, and here in slide five, we get a number for electric, we get a number for water, and we get a number for public benefit. This on the dashboard. Sorry, while I get this together. Actually, I think I can explain. Okay. Um, so the, the total appropriations are what is shown uh, it shown in yellow on slide uh, five. Five. Adds okay. up to 340 million. 340. So okay. it's, it's, this is appropriations versus the fund balance. The fund right. balance oh, is okay. the, the, the total amount of revenue that the utility is expected to have over the fiscal year, right? So you're looking at a, a, a total on the, the dashboard page and a breakdown on, on huh? the, between electric and water. Okay. Yeah, okay, I see. So that. then, um, and then because of the bond proceeds, you have the less the asset capitalization. So if you look at <clears throat> the line that says net surplus, that's what, what would go back in, um, mm. projected into the, into the fund. And of course, some of those numbers, those numbers would be affected as well if, if our, um, we made any adjustments for right now unforeseen between now and, and the beginning of next fiscal year. Okay. So we, you can see again on where you're looking at beginning fund balance, and this is a little deceiving because it's all assets that have been capitalized. So these is buildings and infrastructure and everything. But you see we are pushing the fund balance up, which is a good thing all the way across the board. And as it results, when you take the capitalization out and the, and the facilities, you're getting what we're projecting, if you call, and I mentioned it, the $110 million goal for uh, reserves in electrical, we, we are projecting to well meet that. Um, water is a little bit different because we're not quite sure how the drought's going to impact our revenues. So uh, a lot of that has been speculative on our part as we try to figure out what, what different entities are going to put on us in regards to mandates, and then we see how that how our residents respond and how that affects our sales. We do have a drought charges, but as you know, we're not sure that's something new and we'll see how that covers. So uh, water is a little bit different situation. Public benefit charge obviously is pretty set, but it is based on revenue. So there is some projection to that as well. So we wanted to list some of the capital programs that we're undertaking for 15, 16. These may look familiar because when we came to you with the bond um, recap on both water and electric, we listed everything, but that was for the duration of the bond. Uh, this has it compartmentalized more with the, the fiscal year. So 
Um, there is, uh, in some cases, we've still got some overlap as we're closing some projects, but these are the main projects that we're putting into, into play for the upcoming fiscal year. And a lot of it, as you, as you see, is, is getting to the core infrastructure and upgrading that. Whether it's some of our, you know, Grandview substation, which is a big, big item. We've already started that. We'll continue it next fiscal year. Continuing our modernization effort. The gateways that Ramon spoke about, this is Grandview Gateway, is one that we'll be looking at, getaways, excuse me. Um, and then some of the 4 to 12 kV feeder conversions with specific locations. Okay. Hmm. We've got some routine maintenance. We have to purchase replacement meters for those that, that, we have to, that are damaged or that we have to replace. Transformer purchase is the same. A lot of these are, <coughs> excuse me, um, somewhat routine maintenance. So we go through and keep the system current, replace those that go bad, anticipate those that are going to go bad, and get them fixed before they, they cause a bigger issue. Good preventative maintenance. That's an important part of our CIP program every year. These are some of the projects that we've identified for Grace in specific, and as I mentioned, we've gone through those those uh, the larger list and and really um, honed those down to just those that we feel are absolutely necessary to get us through what would be a <coughs> repowering effort. So we've taken quite a few projects out and set them aside, depending on what the ultimate direction is on the um, repowering of Grayson. So these, again, are, are very necessary, very needed uh, systems. These will keep us going through the hottest part of the year and keep our spinning, non-spinning reserves up uh, and push us through to, to the ultimate uh, repowering effort if that's, in fact, what we decide to do. And I think we have some more at Grayson. Some of this, too, is routine maintenance as engines have to do, be overhauled and upgraded, uh, even those units that are, are newer and, and won't be part of any replacement if, if we go that direction. These are some of our water programs. Again, there's a lot of focus. Um, we've got the, the urban water master plan. Um, some MWD research projects that we're doing as well as, as the maintenance. So again, this just carries on that uh, effort to go at the critical infrastructure. A lot of um, lines, some of these pump stations and motor replacements are, are more or less maintenance that, in, that needs to be done. It's time for us to do that. Pumps and motors go out and need to be replaced. And again, we want to be very proactive in our maintenance program so that we're getting to these, whether we're replacing them or rebuilding them, uh, before they become a much bigger problem. And then you see down here where we have where our main, our primary, our big ticket main replacement projects will be for the coming year. And then we have up there just some, some housekeeping that we have to do at the facilities that we own, uh, whether it's rehabbing and cleaning tanks or whether it's keeping the property around our tank safe and, and um, secure. You'll see those three projects that are up at the reservoir tank category. That's our water program. And here's some recycled projects. So these are really critical for us. We went back through our budget this year and redirected some of our, our funding for a focus on, on recycled water, especially in light of where we're at today with the drought situation. So this is really kind of a, a shot in the arm in, in to, to try to begin to, to focus in. As, as you may recall from our presentation last month, we're also looking at uh, grant funding for several projects, which we're doing very well on, as I understand. At least we're making the final uh, cut on a couple of those. Um, so that will be very, uh, that will be much needed revenue into the system that we can then turn into a capital asset for our recycled program. So do those recycled projects include the grant funding or? No. No, we have, the grant funding would be, the main one we have right now is the Hoover Keppel Toll 
project that we're doing with the school district will bring recycled water to irrigate the, uh, the, the three schools. And we have our project that's up on, um, oh, uh, well, Chevy Oaks is one we were, we were talking about um, uh, putting a grant application in for as well. And, and also um, Camino San Rafael for the common areas up there. That's something you don't see on the list either. And we're going to put that, uh, we're putting in a grant for that as well. What is the Chevy Oaks recycled water tank we have <coughs> for $2.1 million, even though you don't have recycled water up there? That, that's why the last That's part. where the tank is. Okay, even yeah. though there's no recycled water. They don't water have the there. line. That tank doesn't serve just that neighborhood. Well, wouldn't be just for that neighborhood, so it's going to serve a greater area. Okay. But we have the Chevy Oaks project as well included uh, as something for us to look at grant funding for. So what, what does it entail to rehab the tank? What does that mean? Usually you have to go in and it, you just empty it and you go through and you may need to weld it, paint it, coat it, check all of the, the, the connections for it. So generally on steel tanks like that, they need that kind of uh, care and treatment every so often. I don't know what the, the maintenance period would be. Again, it's kind of a, depends on, on the area the tank is. This is recycled water, so it may end up causing that maintenance to occur more often because it has a higher salt content than, than potable water. Because that, that budget just jumps out. It's a high, lot higher than the other rehabs. So is that a special type of tank or much bigger? It's a bigger, bigger tank. It's just much bigger. So all of these, um, the breakdown <clears throat> on um, the capital improvement projects, uh, they're, they're part of the um, 50 50, um, what did I see here? Uh, 50, 50 million, million. 291,000. Correct, yeah, part yeah. of the 50. Okay. This is a breakdown of that. Okay, and these are just the, the major ones. These are pretty much all of them, I all think. All of them? Yes. Because I added them up. We may have some that we still have, we're still, because as I mentioned, we have an overlap, so we're closing some. Yeah, yeah, because what I see here is about maybe 32 million. Um, so there are other ones, right? Mm -hmm. Or may or may not happen? We, we still have some on the books that, that could cost additional funds as we close them out. They're already underway. Okay. So we may end them next fiscal year. So like 75% of them get done this year, 25% next year. We still will have an expenditure for that 25%. So we have that in the budget as we have the overlap. These are the new projects for next fiscal year. None of these have started, none of these are underway, but we do have some overlap, so that causes that number to go up a little bit, mm -hmm. which is typical in capital budgeting. As you pay down, uh, as you finish out projects that may have been budgeted last fiscal year, or even the fiscal year before, some projects are multi-year. Mm -hmm. But so, you have to reallocate that money every year because right. it's only appropriated for a single year. So for this year, um, then that part, the capital improvement part, may be less than $50 million. Is that what I'm hearing? New projects. New ones. New projects, yes. Okay. But um, our total capital budget will be, is estimated today uh -huh. at, at that 50.2. Right, 50.2. Um, in other words, in other words, we could end up with more of a credit. Slide four. More than 32 million of savings. A if we don't do all these projects, we don't do all it, or but eventually, because it's still all bond proceeds, we've got to spend it all. So we'll we'll then carry it over to next year. But yeah, there's a chance that if we start, are we going to do all 32 million of these in one year? There's a good chance we'll we'll have to carry some of those over to the next year just by the nature of the mm -hmm. complexity of the project. And then also but, spending the the rest, the, the 18 million with the existing projects as right. well. Right, so you continue to have that overlap as you carry mm -hmm. forward because it, it, you, know, you need to budget for it so we can start the work and have the mm -hmm. appropriation made by council in place. Um, but sometimes we may get 50, 60, 70 percent of the job done in, in one particular fiscal year and then have to finish it in the next and then we have to reappropriate the money. So what we typically show, we're showing you and what we show council are the new projects um, that are going to be hopefully all opened up um, in the upcoming fiscal year. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so 
You mentioned that, and we had a brief conversation at our last meeting about the revenue projections and the drought rate. In the event that our conservation measures are very successful and we see a rate decline because people are just using less, uh, and if the drought rate isn't sufficient to meet our revenue targets for the year, what's, what's the likely outcome? What's, what's plan B? We'll be returning to council at their request to discuss it. Okay. So whether or not we need to move to a higher drought charge or we need to look at what the future holds, does it mean that we continue to go through the rate structure we have now and with a conscious de decision that we'll have to put a new rate structure in place? Yeah. at the end so is there something we can do now to help offset that but we won't know till we begin to see the actual numbers come in yeah that's why we my recommendation to council was not to put the drought the phase three drought rate in because phase two drought rate is aimed at 20 percent in the coast at 20 percent is what our goal is by the state phase three really just got us that two day a week watering that i wanted at this point in time i don't think it's necessary yet for us to move into that phase three and it's a big jump so if we can accomplish the 20% goal and keep it at the phase two drought rate and our revenues come in, I think we're going to all be uh, a little better off for that. But we won't know as we, and we're going back to council on in November to talk to them about that and show them what <coughs> happens. So we'll go through the hottest part of the year and see how it goes. See what um, transpires. I was not here last month, but uh, from the notes, it says um, from the first paragraph uh, in the water conservation update, GWP will make recommendations to City Council to move into either the Phase 3 or 4 of our mandatory conservation ordinance. We made the recommendation to move to Phase 3. Okay. So, so we left open the Phase 3 or 4 depending on the severity and what we needed to get to. So we were still waiting. As you know, a lot of legislation was, there was a lot of scurrying around in Sacramento, if you will. So when we finally got our number from the State Water Board of 20 percent, um, and then saw some of the specifics of not only the governor's order, but the water board as well. We felt phase three was sufficient at this point. Okay, so uh, that's what we will be. Suggesting. We are in phase we three are. now, effective yeah. April right. 28th. Right. That's two day a week watering, Tuesdays and Saturdays, 10 minutes mm -hmm. per station. Mm -hmm. However, we kept the phase two drought rate in place. So oh, council okay. put a six month um, deferral on that. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the six months, I was asked to go back and just show what the numbers were. Mm, okay, I see. All right, thank you. Any other any other questions, well, comments? Are you done with no. The presentation, Mrs. No, Zoe? I think so. That's Is that the last slide. I guess it was. Okay. Well, yeah. My, my question just refers to slide four again on the reduction in the budget: seventeen million dollars in electric and fifteen point eight million dollars in water. So with that reduction, will the residents see a reduction in their rates if this budget is approved? Uh, and Mr. Yao, I guess I'm not explaining this very well, is that when you, the law requires us to, to put together a cost of service analysis done by an outside consultant, that consultant looks at, at what the, our cost is going to be over the duration, whatever <coughs> period we, we, we choose. Then that is a pro forma, if you will, of where we need to be. So we'll dial in. This is what we, we feel we need from an operational standpoint. One year may be higher than another because we may be getting catching up and then back and, back and being able to back down. So that pro forma is really the blueprint for what we use. That's what the whole rate structure was based on. So that's why the rates aren't 8% every year. That's why they begin to ratchet down because we're able to consequently begin to reduce some of our costs. So we don't have to make the higher uh, rate increase to the residents. So they already built into the rate structure are are getting a benefit from that and we're keeping to the actual pro forma in our budgeting and the bond issue at this point. Once the bond proceeds are done, then we'll go to that pay go. And if you recall, we had numbers built into the COSA on that as well. And we will, those are the numbers we will live by. Um, and, and that's in fact, if we meet our reserve goals, because as I think I mentioned to you, and we did mention to council, if for any reason we don't meet those reserve goals, well then we'll have to back a little bit off, off of our pay-go capital in order to make sure that we have the right balance. But I don't see that happening at this point. I think on the electric side especially, we're doing very well. Um, and then, I, as, I, as you may recall, what I said is, that hopefully gets us to that happy place where we want to be so that the next time we look at the potential of a rate increase, it is something more along the lines of, I'll use the term cost of living adjustments. 
where we can keep the rates to very manageable one or two percent because we can base it specifically on a state federal regulation something that uh, the renewable portfolio may be going up. If something like that happens, it may cost us a little bit more to put more renewables into our portfolio. Then those are things we can make a direct connection to. What we did in the past, as you know, and I hate to keep, I don't want to beat it up anymore because we've done so well and moved on, is we didn't raise rates for a long time. <clears throat> we continued to spend money in certain areas, and the Water Department had particular issues, so we drew down on our reserves. So we had to get back on our feet um, and we base this all on the, the COSA study, so. Oh, yeah, no, that, that's great. I appreciate I mean, the explanation. It's I, hope that, that, <laughs> I hope that was a little better. It, it is better, <laughs> but when the, when the citizens or Glen the residents sees this, that you're reducing a budget by 6% electric and 20% in, in water, they're going to assume that they're going to see that same decrease in their rates next year. And, but that's not true. Based on what your explanation, it's not going to happen. Right. That's not going to happen because that was already built in because we have to make a projection for that far ahead in, in how we're going to spend money. Okay. And if for any reason something happened and we had to come back and spend reserves on an emergency basis, that's what we do. But we wouldn't be going back to the ratepayers to seek more rate money if, if our projections are off. We'll live within the projections that we made and that's what we're doing. And why would you need a decrease in budget proposal? Couldn't you use those? budget the 17 million electric or specifically 15.8 million dollars in water to increase your infrastructure improvement let's say um, increase um, what we claim water to to the point that we can actually do the work so we, what we've pretty much done is max now on the electric side I think you're all aware we do all of our capital work in-house so we have a manpower issue we are maximizing our crews so there's only so much work we can do each year on the water side, we contract that out, but you still have a lot of that same problem and how much you can tear the city up and take water systems down at one time. So I think we're pretty close to maximizing as much infrastructure as we want to do. And any spare money I had, I certainly would pour into that. So that's all been factored as we go ahead. So as you see, you know, we had a lot of projects go out quickly on the bond proceeds as we begin to overlap, pay some of those down, and then move on to the, what's the final years. Of, of the bonds, you know, they're generally about three and a half years each, so we're reaching the end first in water and then the electric will be probably about a year later. So we're doing, we're doing what we projected we would do, and that's hold costs down, because as you recall, when we came back for the rate increase, it wasn't just a matter of laying this all at the feet of the rate payers. There was a, there was a, a necessary um, effort that needed to be put forth by this utility and by me personally to make sure that we reduced our costs on our side as well. And so that's what we've done. And those projections were all made based on that. So, uh, and I'll <clears throat> piggyback on, your, on the point that you're making, uh, Steve. It's, it's not a very satisfying thing to cut or reduce a budget. Um, it would be much nicer to just put that money back into the system, back into the ratepayers, but I think socking away some money uh, in reserve does two things. One is that it just reduces the cost of our debt. So when we do have the debt finance projects, those are, those are cheaper and better for the ratepayers. And then the other thing is when the economy takes another downturn, which it will eventually, it gives us a, an operating reserve to draw from when uh, to, to keep, keep the budget going. And keep in mind, the council <coughs> made a decision to target $110 million for the reserve when actually their council goal or their what the policy had been 120, just under 125 million. So they they cut that back in order to to try to lessen the impact on the ratepayers as well. But knowing knowing full well as as Mr. Hale indicated, you get a recessionary problem or an emergency in an electrical system, as I've learned, they aren't cheap. That money in the bank is important so that you don't have to immediately run back and, and raise rates, uh, you know, large n amounts in order to pay down these emergency issues that come up. That's what reserves are for. So I think healthy reserves that are built up. Now, I'm not talking about building reserves, you know, the mountains of money just to have it. But, a, you know, you look at industry standard, they look at three years of operating expense, or excuse me, three months of three to six months of operating expense in the bank is a good thing to have. Um, I tend to be a little conservative. I'd love to have the six months in the bank just to be safe. Um, I think we'll get there eventually, but I, uh, we're moving in the right direction right now. Um, I um, completely agree with uh, the comments made by uh, Commissioner Ayao as well as Commissioner Hale. Um, 
I know you told me that all this, you know, was planned in the COSA, mm -hmm. and um, I don't doubt you. I'm sure that's in the documentation somewhere. Uh, my suggestion is that um, just be prepared. You know, somebody needs to see our budget documents last year, you know, to show this plan, you know, which at some point we may need to because um, as the, the other two commissioners were saying, uh, we get a credit, but we're not putting it back, you know, in reducing the rates. And um, there may be some people who are going to ask questions. Well, I think the COSA was on. Is it still online? It was online. So we've, we've pushed the COSA, every COSA out mm -hmm. and got online as soon as it was, it was done. Which would include like the budget estimation. We you have know, a budget the estimation, years. the yeah. capital, five-year capital right. program for both right. water and electric. Right. So we've pushed as much of that out as we can and we'll mm -hmm. do more if, if folks want to talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, comments? When, when would this get um, presented to the city council? I believe they're going to have their budget deliberation in, I think it's June 2nd. Our well, next meeting is June 1st, so potentially we could have a discussion just um, just to prep for your meeting. Any changes that you can update us if there's sure. changes? Sure, because we'll have some study sessions between now and then with the council. So if anything changes from what we've shown you on this draft, and it is just that at this point a draft, we can update you. It's not a problem. Okay. Yeah, we can look at the, uh, uh, or add that into the agenda later, the forecast. But at this point, is it appropriate for us to make a recommendation that instead of decreasing the water utility budget by $15.8 million, to take that money and reinvest it in the reclaimed water extend line extensions? Even you can contract it out if you don't have the resources yeah. to do that. Mr. Yao, I can ask Ms. Godinas what recommendation you, you can make under your purview. Um, I, I, you know, we, we have, again, what our plans, and our plans aren't one-year plans. They're multi-year plans. So what, what I think is best for the utility is what I'll recommend, but we certainly can carry forth. Because we're basing the <clears throat> recycle line on the grant that we might get or might not get. So potentially we could use that money, even if you don't, don't get the grant, to implement those recycled water. And, and we could very well do that if, if, we, if the grants don't come in. So we're evaluating that now. Right. But if it don't, the grant doesn't come in, then you already say that $15.8 million, we're not going to ask for that money anymore. If, instead, we're going to leave it in the fund. It's okay, not going mean, anywhere. Okay. We're going to leave it in the fund. It stays in water and power. It's not going to anybody else. So. The, it, it, it would likely go into the reserves, and once those reserves, if we want to come back at some later time and say, we think we should really step up the recycled water program, I could give you a presentation, show you what we have in reserves. You want a recommendation to the council about drawing down on reserves? So, but you know, this again isn't just straight reserves. That's not $15 million going into the reserve account because you have the whole capital asset uh, issue there. But we can. I think Mr. Hale's point about we'll show you the, the, the financial sheets that, that have a little bit more detail and give you like a three-year comparison, then you can see that. Yeah, I, I was just going to mention that it would be helpful to see an appropriation to reserve because uh -huh. I think that's the one thing that's lacking in your, your PowerPoint mm -hmm. is there's no, well, there's no line item for the appropriation to the reserve, which yeah, is you, where the reduction is going. You get the capital asset. Right. So, you know, really what it, it comes down to is the, give me as a, as you look at about three point, um, four million in electric, and at this in the, on this figure, four point eight million dollars in water. So, and then to look at that's in excess of of your operating expenses. So, when do we expect the to hear from the grant from the state? We just heard that we made the top ten on the Hoover Keppel toll. So, you know, there's a pool of money. They take the projects. They evaluate them. So I'm guessing because there's a lot of pressure in Sacramento to move these things out that we should probably should. We may very well know by our next meeting. So we, if, if in fact we get the grant, we'll, we'll update you on that. But if we don't get the grant for the other proposal, then we could likely use the, um, the reserve funds potentially if we make that recommendation and if city council wants to move Then on. we would give you a more detailed overview of the reserve funds so you can make a conscious decision. So to just say we should spend $4 million and take it out of reserves 
may not be the decision you want to make. Yeah, you want to right. see what we have before you spend it. Yeah, so Steve, to that point, um, and you made an earlier comment about if our pattern of expenses are not lining up with the COSA assumptions, right, um, that you would be looking at further cutbacks. I would hope that you would bring that bring those back to us and bring those back to council before making any of those cutbacks because they may be penny wise and prudent at the moment but pound foolish for long term operations for the utility and that's that's where I want to I, I you know this is where we have an oversight role and a in an advisory role to try and figure out what the what the best approach would be um, before making any further cutbacks if we're not meeting the COSA assumptions for whatever reason I could update you on that Any other? I assume, right? <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, because Fine. you know my my direction from the council is to live within my budget. You know they don't want to see me back asking for more money, and I also am the one responsible for doing what's in the best interest of the utility on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that, you know, uh, you, there's no way I ever harm this utility. It's not why I was put here, and that's not what I intend to do. But certainly we can update you. Yeah, well, and, and COSA being what it is, it, you also have to keep the lights on and the, and the water running. Absolutely. So if, that's, if there, there's any threat to the short or long-term uh, ability for you to do that, then I think that we, that needs to be that taken into be account before. That was we talk about quickly. Yeah, so that, that needs to be taken into account before we make wild budget cuts in order to live within an mm -hmm. assumption that we made a year And we just ago. don't see that happening. I think yeah. the COSA was done. You, you put a lot of time and effort into that, and as we told you, there's, I don't know, there was 15 or 16 versions of the, of the document. So it may not be perfect, but it's going to be pretty close. And we've been doing this for a long time, so you know you can make certain projections. Now there are some things we don't know what the state government might do or what regulatory bodies might do, and that can have an impact. But usually, it's not something that's so drastic that you, you, it, it requires something immediate. So always, we will live within our means. Um, but I don't see that as being anything very drastic. I think we've built this COSA pretty solidly, mm -hmm. and it gives us enough area to to maneuver if we run into to a bit of a difficult problem. And at the end of the day, if it means we might not be able to put as much in reserves uh, as we would, that's fine. I mean, operationally, we're as thin as I would like to see us from, from boots on the ground standpoint, so. Okay, sounds good, yeah. Thank you for um, the uh, willingness to uh, communicate and share. All right, um, are we done with the questions and comments? Okay. <laughs> We do have a speaker on this for a uh, Mr. Harry Zavel, please. Please limit to uh, five minutes. Yeah, I, I, I just have a question, and I, I don't think uh, I spoke to Ramon. I don't think at this point it could be answered. I was ask, I was asking whether or not when uh, Mr. Zern refers to the pro forma, he's referring to the technical uh, appendices to that pro forma. I've looked at that and. It has takes a base year, I forget whether it's 2011, 2012, or whatever it is, and has all the various categories of expenditures by the utility or obligations of the utility with figures. And I was just curious as to whether that was the item that uh, uh, you're referring to as a pro forma. And uh, Ramon said it's been a long time since he's looked at it, so I, I assume that's not a question you can answer now. No, and Mr. Zavos, it's it's um, it's like, when I say it, I, I, I use it in a more general term. So it may include data from there, may include data on the actual budget we put together for the rate structure. Um, but. I refer to it as a pro forma. That may make some accountants cringe, as I may not be using well, yeah, I was just technology. Uh, but as you know, the COSA sets forth essentially our budget, and that's what we base the rate structure on. So those appendices are all do catching. And I, it's true, I haven't looked at the, the document. Yeah, so I, if, if we, I, we can answer. We can, yeah, as you know, it, you know. It, it, you know where to find us, so we yeah, would be happy uh, to. So uh, I guess that's not a question that could be answered at this time. Thank you. OK, thank you. Next item, please. Mm -hmm. 4B, Integrated Resource Plan Update, Ramona Boyd. So before Mr. Boyd gets up here to kick this off, Madam President, members of the commission, I, let's see, we'll get the cover page, Tanya. So this is our, our balancing act that we, we have in, in GWP where we, we've got the utility that, that on its shoulders, so to speak, are these three critical components of reliability, affordability, and sustainability. And we have to be able to balance those 
uh, and, and to bring to our customers uh, reliable, affordable electricity, but also we must we want to be good stewards of the environment, not only to meet the, the goals, objectives and mandates of the state, but also just to be good stewards on our own, whether we're being uh, directed to or not. So that balancing act, although somewhat it looks simple here and Ramon has done a great job in putting this together, it's quite an attractive uh, uh, graphic, um, but it isn't easy to do that. And the IRP is is a critical component, uh, and the and the, and what's included in the IRP are the critical components for us to be able to do that. Grayson is one part of that, and as you're going to see when when Mr. Abueg and our uh, consulting group from Pace Global gets up, uh, you're going to see that it there's there's other things that are involved as well that went into this uh, very very comprehensive effort. And we've been happy with with how this has proceeded. And this is the uh, the first showing uh, of the results of that. So, Ramon, why don't you kick it off? Uh, while you're pulling these, uh, pulling the presentation up, I have a question. Were these sent out to us? These presentations, no, uh, Madam President, some weren't because some weren't ready. Okay. Yeah, because I didn't see any of these. Yeah, some okay. of us, some of the, we did not have the, the okay. documents ready. So I understand. We don't have busy. those. We won't send right. them out. And okay. We'll try to get them to you as soon as we right. can. As but in can. some cases, this one in particular, we had them for you at the dais. Okay. All right. I, I, I just want to remind you that um, I have made this request before. Presentations such as these, you know, we like to get them uh, earlier at least a day before. So we best have a chance we can. to read. Yeah. As best okay. we as can. As best as you can. Yes, all right. Thanks. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Commissioners uh, Ramon Abuek, uh, Assistant General Manager for GWP. Uh, before I introduce our presenters from PACE Consulting, uh, just want to explain why are we here, why is the IRS, IRP re relevant, and why is it necessary. There's a lot of components that go into the IRP. Mainly, there's a lot of questions. What do we do with the Grayson Power Plant? We know the status of Grayson. We know it's aging. Actually, it's not aging. It is old. Uh, and uh, so we're making, we had to make an informed decision what to do with the Grayson Power Plant. There's a lot of regulations that we have to comply with, which is the environmental requirements, the sustainability. We have the new RPS, uh, the greenhouse gas, and the renewables that are coming to picture. So, um, and at the same time, we're also looking at our relationship with at the intertie, the, our transmission, how were we balancing. The, the load versus the resources that we get from the external. Uh, one of the items that uh, I believe Commissioner O'Hell was asking about is, are we looking at storage options? Okay, uh, how does that benefit us? And then at the bottom line, or bottom line of this at the end is, how do we do this so that we minimize the impact on our rate payers? So there's a lot of requirements that we have to meet in terms of reliability and sustainability, and most importantly, is how do we do this so that we don't impact the rate as much as possible. So with that, I'm going to introduce the, the presenters that we have from Pace Global. Uh, so Pace Global is a leading provider of energy consulting and management services, and they've been around for 45 years. As of 2011, they became part of the, the Siemens Group. Uh, they are in the energy and resource planning, risk management, and energy and market uh, commercial advisory. They have performed and supported integrated resource planning work on behalf of several uh, utilities across the U.S. Some of them are here locally, being the city of Pasadena. Um, and our first presenter is Mr. Gary uh, Vicinus. He's the vice president and managing director at Pace Global. He has 38 years of experience in the energy industry, and 34 years of those is being a, as a cons energy consulting business. He has developed uh, uh, Pace Global's risk integrated resource plan methodology and has ever seen the work of several clients. The next presenter uh, is Pat Augustine, who is the executive director of Pace Global. He has a bachelor's degree from Harvard University and master's degree from Duke. Uh, he has 10 years of experience conducting power asset evalu evaluations 
and experience in integrating key market drivers such as fuel prices, environmental compliance costs, demand projections, and re regulatory outcomes into the analysis. So with that, let me introduce uh, Mr. Gary Bucinas first. Thank you, Madam President and members of the Commission. We appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. And if uh, you have any questions, just stop us as we go along, and, and we'll be happy to answer uh, as, as, best or, as best we can. Um, just uh, for your edification, we've been working, Pace Global's been working with Glen Glendale Water and Power for approximately six years off and on. Uh, we've been involved in some of their renewable strategies uh, we've been working at Shoal Canyon, so we understand a number of the issues before we develop this fully integrated resource plan. And uh, as Ramon pointed out, we have worked with utilities across the country, and the process and the approach that we're going to describe to you today is something that we've been using for over a decade uh, with utilities across the country, working with city councils, working with public utility commissions, and uh, this is a very accepted process. And Steve pointed out that the, that the approach that you need to take in an IRP is something that has to be an integrated approach that actually looks at a variety of objectives and balancing those objectives of lease cost, rate stability, environmental stewardship, uh, reliability, uh, diversity, things like that. And the approach that we take I think one of the things that differentiates us from some others is that many look at re at least cost plans and then look at sensitivities. We try and embody all of those risks into the approach that we build. So the, the five-step process that I'm going to describe to you first before we get into some of the results of our screening analysis and then our full-blown portfolio analysis is to start with those, those uh, key objectives. and. Um, I'm going to go through uh, a list of those uh, that have been objectives that have been identified um, by Glendale, which <coughs> include minimizing costs. It, it includes improving the rate stability uh, to customers, uh, reducing volatility and managing risk, improving reliability, advancing uh, uh, environmental stewardship, and supporting financial stability. All of those will be evaluated and part of the evaluation that we'll show you in, in a few minutes. But that's the very first step in the process is to identify those and identify metrics uh, that go along with those. Uh, the second step that we take is we go through a screening process. Uh, we've been working with the engineering firm that was selected uh, by Glendale, which is Stantec. And they have provided us a lot of information on the cost of various supply options and demand options that have gone into this screening analysis. And they've actually conducted some of the screens associated with how to repower Grayson and also to look at some of the other options uh, that are evaluated as part of this process. So we start with a very wide range of costs, and then we try and narrow them down based upon uh, their performance characteristics and the cost characteristics of those of those options and narrow them down and then combine them together so uh, we started with probably um, a, probably more than 10 different options for grace and repowering we narrowed those down from a cost perspective and Stantec narrowed that down to five which we combined with various renewable portfolio options uh, we started with six different renewable portfolio options, including two different locations for wind, solar, geothermal, uh, and, and biomass. And we looked at those combinations and then narrowed those down through a cost perspective and then started forming portfolios. Those portfolios would manage, would meet load and meet all of the, re the renewable constraints, the carbon constraints, the uh, spinning reserves and non-spinning reserve requirements associated with it. And we define these portfolios. All of them will meet all of those requirements. And then we'll analyze those portfolios against different market and regulatory conditions. 
which is basically the third step in the process. So the second step is screening. You come down to some, some options, you combine them into portfolios, and then you test the portfolios against different market and regulatory scenarios to make sure that the portfolio that we recommend to you as a third party independent perspective is one that best meets all of those objectives across a wide variety of future market conditions. So that's the process that we'll go through and we'll go through these one at a time with you and explain to you exactly how we screened down these options, narrowed them down, selected portfolios, and then evaluated against the market conditions and achieve the, the recommendations that we're going to give to you today. So going back to this slide on the objectives, which is the first step in that process, um, we identified for each objective a metric, one or more metrics, to evaluate through this process so that we could show you the trade-offs associated with these different objectives over time. For the minimizing cost, we basically look at the net present value of total generation costs for each portfolio. Uh, we have levelized that in, because most people tend to think in terms of dollars per megawatt hour, it's an easy way to kind of look at how costs compare to what costs are today. So we basically converted that to a dollar per megawatt hour basis, which is levelized over the 20-year planning horizon. That's a fairly standard metric for looking at least cost. For uh, rate stability and managing the risk to rate payers, we selected two different metrics. One is we looked at the range of cost across all of the scenarios that we constructed, and we basically looked at the worst outcome as being <coughs> the riskiest outcome. So sometimes when you look at it from a reference case or a best guess case, you get one perspective, but when you look at the worst outcome, very often the portfolio that looks good on a best guess estimate may have a lot of volatility, it may uh, have a, a great deal of uncertainty associated with it, and so the least cost may not be the same thing as the worst outcome. And so we've selected that as one of uh, the metrics on stability. The other is reliance on market transactions. And I'm sure everybody knows that the market can be volatile uh, at various points in time. So if you're relying very heavily on the market and you incur market volatility, it could, re it could reduce the stability of the portfolio. And so we look at that as a metric as well. The third is reliability. Uh, we've done, uh, we've conducted a loss of load uh, study uh, of all of the portfolios to be able to assess whether or not they meet the NERC requirements, uh, which is basically one event in 10 years. And so we've evaluated the different portfolios to see if they can meet that objective. And we've also measured the costs associated with uh, the potential loss of load <coughs> equivalents for uh, these portfolios looking forward as a measure of reliability. The fourth is environmental stewardship, and typically we use two different measures. One is the renewable percentage, uh, and all the portfolios that we put together will meet the minimum requirements, but we will look at uh, if, if any of these achieve greater than that, we will, we will factor that in and show you that as well. And we'll also look at uh, carbon emissions. And we will look to see how the various portfolios' uh, average emissions are over the entire planning horizon so that you have a perspective on that as well. In this way, you'll be able to address the uncertainties or the trade-offs between these different objectives over time. So some may be lowest, lowest cost but have the highest emissions or lowest cost and have the highest risk. And then we'll look at the total invested capital as a measure of stability. Uh, of the financial stability, but recognize that, uh, that that is just one measure. And in fact, as long as the amount of capital that you have to spend uh, meets all of your coverage ratios and other financial metrics, it may not be as important as the others, as long as the overall costs associated with that are built into the, co the first two items, which is the, the overall cost minimization. So we will show that as well. So you'll have five metrics that we'll be evaluating over the course of uh, the next few minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, just stop me. 
Um, this is a, a step, uh, stepwise approach that says that a number of the issues that Ramon mentioned uh, to start the process, including the grace and repowering, which of course is one of the most important factors uh, in this evaluation, RPS requirements, uh, those are going to be addressed at least initially in the screening process. They will be readdressed as part of the overall portfolios that we're going to develop. But in addition, we had to consider the fact that the San Juan power plant uh, will terminate in 2017. And so you have to consider how are you going to replace that power. Uh, we have to consider that IPP, will, the contract there, will terminate in 2027. And so we're, we've looked at various options for both of them to evaluate what are the best options that could go into the portfolio along with the grace and repowering options. We've considered energy storage of various types, both uh, uh, at the grid level and behind the meter. We were also looking at uh, some for dealing with some of the tie line uh, issues uh, for storage to try and manage, manage that, and we'll talk about that as well. So we've looked at storage in a variety of different lights uh, diff with a variety of diff different technologies. And we've looked at uh, uh, the landfill gas at uh, at Shoal Canyon, and the evaluation that we've performed there is to evaluate whether to continue to supply that gas to Grayson or to evaluate that against various options that are actually uh, gener putting generation at the site and taking advantage of some of the economics associated with that. So we've evaluated three options there as well. We have uh, we've done two different uh, uh, special studies. One is looking at time of use rates, which we've, we've, we've evaluated in the context, now that there are meters for all customers, there's an ability to, to look at time of use rates, along with a number of other uh, options. We've specifically looked at time of use rates to determine how that strategy might impact the shape of the load and what advantages and what costs are associated with that. And uh, we built that into one of the scenarios that we've looked at, and Pat will describe that in a couple of minutes. We've also looked at the, the potential penetration of distributed generation, um, looking at uh, technology advances, and we've made <coughs> we've de determined based upon the analysis that we've performed that there could be substantial penetration uh, from distributed generation over time. Uh, I believe we, we looked at over 40 megawatts uh, which is a pretty significant amount by 2030. And so we built that actually into our scenarios as well. And then the portfolio modeling handles the carbon. Uh, the, uh, I will note that the transmission options relate to the size of the grace and repowering. So we built that into the portfolio analysis, and we'll show you exactly how we did that. And then we've considered energy market structure and ancillary services as part of the overall portfolio modeling. So from a process standpoint, I think uh, we're, we're taking a, a fairly traditional approach in terms and a very structured approach that we've applied many times over, over the years. And, uh, and we're building in a lot of the specifics associated with uh, Glendale's specific situation to make sure that we capture all of that in our analysis as well. This is a graphic that basically shows uh, the existing portfolio if left alone uh, and, and basically when you will need uh, additional capacity. And note that this is name, oh, gee, the, uh, the red light works until I actually try and put it on the screen. <laughs> and then it, then it goes blank again. I can do it on the wall, but I can't do it on the screen. So if you look at the black line, that's basically uh, the uh, load forecast, the peak load forecast uh, projection over time. It rises for a couple of years as uh, some new customers are added, and then it declines slightly uh, due in part to a lot of the, the programs, the energy efficiency programs that are, that are in place. Comparing that to the capacity, uh, you can see the bar charts of the different types of capacity that are in there. And this includes um, the existing grace and capacity as if it were available all the time. In fact, from a capacity standpoint, the difference between capacity and energy is that uh, capacity looks like it's there, and that's the maximum amount that could be available to meet load. 
energy cost, which we'll look at separately as a graph in a couple of minutes, shows what actually is available and what is economic to run. So uh, this basically shows that um, if you did nothing, even if Shoal Canyon was available uh, all the time, which is basically the orange, I, I'm sorry, not Shoal Canyon, but Grayson, which is basically the orange bars, um, you would need capacity uh, by 2022. This doesn't even reflect the reserve margins that, ha that are a requirement that are on top of the peak load. So in fact, it's saying that you need uh, capacity prior to 2022 and probably about as quickly as you can build it, which in the case of Grayson is probably about 2019. So that's what's reflected from a, a capacity standpoint. So this is nameplate capacity for GWP's owned resources, correct? That is correct. Okay. That's absolutely correct. So the, uh, the screening process that, we, uh, that I've described already starts basically at the top where you're looking at the various uh, supply options, including grace and repowering, renewables. Uh, we've looked at, uh, to replace IPP, we've looked at some options with regard to natural gas and other things that we'll talk about, storage and, of course, the landfill gas. We, we, we rank them by cost and environmental performance. We make sure that the portfolios we construct as we narrow down through that process all meet all of the constraints all of the time. And then uh, we test each portfolio against the market conditions. And that's basically a, pic a picture of basically the process that we're going to go through. And what I'm going to ask uh, Pat Augustine to do is to walk you through each of the screening options that we talked about one by one so that you can see how we develop the portfolios. And then I'll come back and go through the results of the analysis and our recommendations. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, I, I have a question. Yes. On uh, page three, mm -hmm. so slide, I mean, the, the one with the bars, um, I think, I think it's uh, the slide uh, right, right before the other one, uh, after. It's uh, slide six, yeah, page six. Page six? That one. Uh-huh. Um, so that shows uh, 2022, uh, the orange bar, which is the existing Grayson, Yes. Went down to like about uh, a third of 2015. Right. And, and basically this is uh, based on an expectation of as you spend less and less on Grayson, parts of the plant the, will, will fail. And so basically we've put together a process that basically uh, eliminates some of the, the power plants over time based upon how much is continuing to be spent in this case. And this case is the status quo, which doesn't look at any of the repowering options. So we're showing that part of the overall requirements will decline over time if you don't continue to put more and more dollars into it, which is part of the economics. Right. And is that really our intention? Is it because we're going to more and more renewables? Is that really our intention of not using Grayson as much by 2022? Well, one of the options that they're looking at is to phase the plant out. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So that that's time. that's partly what they've taken into consideration. And, mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> that would mean you would begin to retire units as they um, as they expire. Is there <laughs> economic <laughs> life? Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, okay. um, and even even if you made a conscious decision to keep spending money, there's no guarantee that, that you have enough money or the money will even mm -hmm. fix what, what's there mm -hmm. because some of it is so old. So mm -hmm. this is kind of the option where Grayson begins to ride off into the sunset, and if we weren't right. to do anything else, we'd begin to find ourselves in right. shortages. So how would we make that up? These so this is, this, is the, this is the basis, basis for looking yes. at all of the other Are options the, the for So we'll have a different picture associated with the different options that we'll show you in a few minutes. Sounds good. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you, Gary. So as, as was just mentioned, what we're going to do in the next phase here is go through uh, an overview of the screening findings in each of these five key categories and ultimately integrate everything into these integrated portfolios that were referenced. Uh, and then eventually get back to the key findings and results for each of them. Uh, so as Gary mentioned, please feel free to, to interrupt and question as we go through it. 
um, and we'll try to be as efficient as possible, but, but allow you to, to question everything that went into the analysis. So as was mentioned, we had five key screening elements. Uh, number one was Grayson, uh, and we'll go into a little bit more detail, but uh, ultimately what was done was nine independent configurations for the site <coughs> to repower the site were developed uh, by Stantec, the engineering firm, and we narrowed those options based on economic analysis to four. And uh, in all options across the board, Unit 9, the, most, the newest unit, is kept around, uh, and the repowerings uh, for the older fleet. On the renewables, uh, as was mentioned, we evaluated the costs uh, and operational um, uh, realities and technical feasibility of six different renewable options, uh, ultimately narrowed those down to combinations of intermittent wind and solar and geothermal. Uh, Intermountain power, uh, another big issue. We have tested three distinct options there. Uh, we've tested a new combined cycle combustion turbine, which would be uh, part of a consortium of uh, current plant owners going into a potential new development there. But we've tested that against uh, building a simple cycle peaker with a partner at that site or simply walking away from uh, the current uh, contract after expiry and uh, doing nothing but possibly needing to secure additional transmission for that pathway. Uh, we've narrowed it down to a combined cycle being the most economic, uh, but we'll talk about the fact that those uh, options need to be kept open uh, given uncertainty there. On storage, we uh, evaluated three different types of options. Uh, we've screened out grid scale and behind the meter storage on their own. Uh, but we're still looking at uh, an option for regulation services, and that's still under study, and uh, conclusions on that are forthcoming. And then finally, as Gary mentioned, we developed uh, three distinct turbine and uh, combustion engine options for burning the landfill gas at Shoal Canyon. Uh, this is a separate analysis from Grayson, uh, but we'll go through the draft findings uh, uh, that have been found at that site as well. So on the Grayson screening, uh, the initial technology screen was performed by Stanton, and as I mentioned, nine distinct options uh, were developed. And in the graphic here, what you'll see is a naming convention that we'll start to use as we go through the analysis here. And we've named the different portfolios according to the capacity of new additions at Grayson. Uh, so there's a 150 megawatt family shown in blue, a 200 megawatt family shown in orange and a 250 megawatt shown in purple. And that represents, roughly speaking, um, and not everything goes to that exact uh, precision, but roughly speaking, the amount of new megawatts added at Grayson. And two different technology types were assessed. And we have specific vendors as representative of uh, technology types in order to build up operational assumptions, costs, and so on. But by no means would the city be limited to these vendors. Uh, but we've looked at uh, a Wartzilla option, which is an internal combustion engine, and uh, GE LM6000 simple cycle or combined cycle natural gas fired uh, turbines. And what we've done is evaluated from a cost basis these nine different portfolio configurations uh, to look at how they stack up against each other. And you'll note on the vertical axis here, this is the first time we'll start to show some results for this levelized net present value of portfolio cost concept. So the overall idea here is that the lower the cost over a 20-year planning horizon, uh, the more economically advantageous that option is. And as we evaluate all nine of those options, um, at this stage of the game, we've been able to screen out five of them because they're higher cost. And the unshaded uh, portfolio options shown here are the top four that have made it through that initial screen that was shown in the funnel. <clears throat> and those four include 150B, which is three simple cycles uh, at 160 megawatts or so, 200B, four simple cycles, 200C, which is three simple cycles plus a combined cycle, and 250D, which is two simple cycles and two combined cycles. So overall, those Wartzilla internal combustion engines were found to be much higher cost than the alternative, mostly due to their inflexibility and their requirement to run at certain high levels due to emission uh, <coughs> regulations. And we've narrowed it down to those four combinations shown here. Now, moving on, critical to the Grayson screening is potential transmission requirements. And, uh, 
Glendale is required to have a certain amount of transmission capacity for reliability purposes from the external environment. And what that means is, depending on what's done at Grayson, uh, there could be requirements to have additional transmission capacity uh, to serve local requirements. And simply put, the 150 megawatt portfolios, roughly speaking, would need 100 megawatts of new transmission. Uh, the 200 megawatt portfolios would need an incremental 50 megawatts of new transmission, whereas the 250 megawatt portfolios would need no additional renewable, uh, pardon me, uh, transmission from the uh, external environment. And the reason for that, of course, is the 250 megawatt family would more than compensate and replace the, the current older fleet of Grayson units that are retiring, whereas the uh, lower amounts uh, would leave a situation to have less local capacity than, than currently exists now. So to deal with that issue, we've looked at two specific options for the city. Uh, number one, rent transmission access, uh, effectively pay LADWP. Uh, for the right to have additional transmission through the system. Or number two, build and own a new interconnection uh, to SoCal Edison and the California ISO. <clears throat> so based on the screening done to date, uh, on a purely economic basis, uh, the building and owning appears to be less expensive, potentially, uh, for that 150 portfolio family that requires new transmission. Uh, and that's based on the open access transmission tariff that LA has versus the potential to build this new line uh, out to the CAISO. Now, the issue, though, is that that build and own option carries quite a lot of additional risk. Uh, first of all, there are cost uncertainties uh, to develop the transmission through the city <coughs> and out to the interconnection point. And also significant uncertainties on what additional costs the city may have to assume in the event of other reliability issues throughout the system. So if there's an interconnection to that point, um, the owner of that new line would be responsible for uh, alleviating any other uh, congestion issues on the line. That issue has not been studied in detail yet. Uh, so without knowing that type of uh, detailed transmission study, there's a, there's a real cost risk there. Secondly, the reliability of new connection with the California ISO is uncertain. Uh, we don't have a good handle on uh, the frequency of potential outage or losing that line. And thirdly, um, a significant new transmission uh, connection uh, could increase Glendale's single largest contingency, uh, which is effectively a means of planning for reserves. Uh, so if you have a larger contingency um, that could go down, you have to have more local resources available on site to back that up. And we haven't fully analyzed uh, that impact to date. So overall, as a result of these risks, uh, what we're doing from now forward is developing the portfolios with the rent option. It's a much more defined cost, uh, but recommending that we continue to study the build and own option uh, to get a better handle on whether those risks can be mitigated or if the uh, high-end possibilities of both operational and cost risks would be imprudent to carry forward. So just uh, while we're on this slide, it, reading your footnote, it says there's an upfront cost of $66 million to build out the, the, rent, the uh, build and own option, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the LADWP tariff would just be $5.2 million a year, and that's just what it costs. Exactly. So if we decided to go to the build own option, later, we're not sinking any capital into the LADWP option, right? We're not, there's no... That's correct. That's an annual fee. Okay. fee. Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so that covers the, the Grayson element. So it's important to keep in mind we've got four configurations on Grayson. We're going forward uh, with an assumption that the additional transmission in those portfolios that need it would be rented from L.A., so the second key issue was around renewables. And there's really two key questions here that, that we attempted to answer at the screening phase. First of all, what resources, what types of renewable resources should be embedded in the plan? And secondly, um, is there a need for what is known as third-party firming resources for the intermittency uh, associated with certain renewables? Or could a repowered Grayson with flexible gas-fired capacity effectively firm up those renewables on their own? And what that means is wind and solar is not a resource that uh, at the moment can be relied upon every hour. The wind patterns change. The sun comes up and goes down. 
So in order to have a firm supply of that resource, uh, you have to either be able to manage the intermittency uh, with local resources, such as a, a new Grayson fleet, or uh, pay a third party uh, to firm it uh, to better align with the peak requirements uh, that the city's load profile may have. So on the first question, just what are the resources, as was mentioned before, we took a list of uh, six diverse options and, and screened it down to wind, solar, and geothermal. Uh, as being the lowest cost combination of remote uh, renewable options. Wind from the northwest, solar PV uh, from the southwest or California, and geothermal also uh, from remote regions to the east. And on number two, the question about uh, third-party firming, what we found is that uh, wind and solar unfirmed, uh, the blue, and geothermal with wind and solar unfirmed, the green, are lower cost than paying for an external third-party uh, firming service. And I think the takeaway here is really uh, the cost of, of Glendale's debt is lower than a third party. Uh, and if you're going to go f forward and do a repowering of Grayson with a flexible um, gas peaking or combustion turbine or combined cycle unit, you have the ability to take advantage of the intermittency or manage the intermittency at a lower cost than paying for a third party to do that. So. Um, assuming that we go with option 250D for Grayson, how much of that is the peaking, peaking resource and how much of that is, is just constant baseload? Well, it would be, um, if we go back just two slides here, we have uh, two simple cycles and two combined cycles. It's about 140 megawatts of combined cycle and then roughly another 100, 110 of simple cycle. So the combined cycle will be close to baseload, not necessarily around the clock, um, but you know, 70% type capacity factors, whereas the simple cycles uh, would be more peaking. All right, third mass major topic was Intermountain Power. Uh, as was mentioned, we looked at three distinct options here on IPP. Uh, first of all, shut down and don't replace the capacity, effectively walk away from the current agreement uh, after it expires, uh, effectively don't go into a new agreement for new capacity. But in order to maintain the transmission rights or the transmission access that you want for other remote sources out there, uh, pay an additional 50 megawatts of transmission access fees as, as per the rent assumptions described before. Number two, uh, develop a combustion turbine out at the IPP site with a potential partner. <coughs> or number three, uh, join a consortium of existing plant owners that are looking to develop a new large natural gas-fired combined cycle. Uh, those uh, discussions are underway in preliminary phases at this point in time. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty about the schedule of that, but we know that that's a feasible option uh, going forward. And based on the economic screening of those three options, uh, it comes out as the lowest cost. So although there is uh, a fair amount of work to be done on what that cost profile will look like, what that flexibility will look like, how that will impact the transmission system, what the screening indicates is that all the portfolios uh, going forward uh, should, for planning purposes, be looking at those options, but be planning around the combined cycle as the lowest cost option at IPP uh, for Glendale. Fourth item is storage. Uh, we looked at three different storage options, one still in process, all at the utility level, utility perspective, I should say. Uh, so storage economics may vary between customers and the utility, uh, but each of these three analyses are very focused on Glendale's perspective. First of all, at the grid scale. Uh, what this means is uh, large-scale storage um, at the wholesale level, basically shifting energy from the off-peak to the peak periods. So wind uh, that may blow more prominently overnight, storing it and having it be available during the peak periods at a large grid scale level. And we evaluated battery uh, costs declining quite significantly by about 75-80% over the next decade or so. But even with those declining cost expectations, uh, those additions at the grid scale, just looking at energy shifting, uh, are not cost effective at this time from the utility perspective. Secondly, uh, kind of the, the flip side of that is behind the meter scale. Uh, so we're now talking about on customer 
cited uh, locations. Uh, we've looked at thermal <coughs> energy storage, um, another energy shifting uh, solution uh, to look at shifting energy requirements again from overnight off-peak periods to the peak period. And what we found here as well is that the behind the meter options are, are not cost effective uh, given, uh, again, the utility perspective, uh, given the assumption that Glendale would pay for all of this, and given the fact that other uh, elements in the portfolio do not have a strong capacity need to shift that energy from uh, more than just an energy shift uh, as opposed to avoiding future capacity. Now, if there was a different capacity situation or if customers uh, helped pay for, for those uh, resources, the economics might change. But again, from Glendale's uh, viewpoint uh, on your own, uh, the behind the meter scale solution is not cost effective. And then finally, this inter intra hour regulation and avoided cost issue associated with the tie line deviations with LA that was referenced is currently under study. Uh, this is more of a very granular regulation issue. Uh, as plants go down, our load deviates a few megawatts from what the forecast may have been. Um, LA is, has a penalty structure if you're deviating by more than eight megawatts. And if you're able to control that with a very flexible battery, there could be some economic advantages. Uh, that element of the study is still underway and we'll hope to report back shortly. And the final screening element is around the <coughs> landfill gas. Um, so as was mentioned, we're looking at options to generate electricity at the Shoal Canyon location as opposed to piping the LFG over to Grayson. And what we've developed uh, in consultation, again, with uh, the engineers uh, hired as part of the project are three different options uh, associated <coughs> with uh, burning the LFG at the Shoal Canyon site. And we're representing them with the actual technologies and uh, turbine names that the vendors uh, that have been reviewed uh, give those technologies. But again, this could be open to uh, competitive bidding at some point in time. It's really just designed to get a look at the operational and cost elements of, of different options. Number one is the Caterpillar internal combustion engine option. And then number two and three are combustion turbine options um, by the solar manufacturer uh, named the Mercury and Taurus turbines. Um, in all three cases, we've got a capital expenditure of around $20 million or so associated with this uh, project. But the different options have uh, slightly different capital costs, slightly different operating costs, and slightly different efficiencies of converting the landfill gas to electricity. So when you compare the three against each other, um, we've found that the Caterpillar option, the internal combustion engine option, is the lowest cost. And that's due to three factors. Number one, it's got lower upfront capital costs. Uh, number two, it is more efficient from a heat rate basis, the efficiency of converting uh, landfill gas to power electricity. And as a result, it avoids incremental energy that the other two options would otherwise have to purchase or foregone sales in the market. And number three, because it's more efficient, it generates more renewable power that you can credit towards the RPS and avoid future uh, investments in other renewables uh, that would hit various targets over time. So the key conclusion here is that First of all, uh, all in, given that extra capital cost um, for a new resource, you actually can get cost savings per megawatt hour for what you're doing with the landfill, given that uh, the current system is very inefficient. And you have uh, almost a doubling in potential renewable output associated with uh, upgrading the efficiency of, of the landfill conversion to electricity. So all of those various screening exercises uh, effectively look at the key questions one by one and ultimately come up with a few um, strategies going forward to integrate into what we're characterizing now as integrated portfolios. And the remainder of the presentation here will go through the, the key elements, attributes, and findings associated with nine candidate portfolios that were developed out of this screening exercise. And there's four key variables associated with each of them. First, what to do at Grayson. Second, what to do with the LFG. 
Third, what to do at IPP. And fourth, what to do with the renewables. Uh, and again, those are all the screenings that we've just talked about. So candidate option one is what we were re referencing before, run to fail. Uh, effectively invest a certain amount of ongoing capital and O&M associated with the existing Grayson units, uh, but do not invest beyond that. Uh, don't invest in new uh, LFG technology or generation on site, but continue to go ahead with the renewables uh, investments uh, to meet RPS and pursue the new combined cycle at IPP. Then the next eight uh, are referring back to the renewable screening we talked about and the Grayson screening we talked about, the four Grayson options and the two leading renewable options. And they're all variants on each other. Uh, so numbers two and three are the 150B Grayson option, three simple cycles combined with either just wind and solar and then wind, solar, and geothermal. Then four and five is the same idea, but the 200B family, which is the four simple cycles. Six and seven, same idea, but with the three simple cycle, one combined cycle combo. And eight and nine is the same idea with the two simple cycle, two combined cycle combination. So from that screening, what we've done is, is uh, take a look at key uh, leading technologies in each category and develop a series of integrated portfolios that we can then evaluate uh, in quite a lot more detail. So what do these portfolios look like? And for simplicity purposes, uh, in the different families, there's very minor <coughs> differences in the renewables. So we can really show five, five concepts here, run to fail, and then the four Grayson concepts with each of the other elements in the portfolio. And here on page 16, we have a, a supply and demand balance out in 2030. So if the strategy is uh, pursued uh, over the planning horizon, what will the nameplate capacity uh, look like for each of these portfolio options against uh, potential peak demand, as well as the regulatory requirement that you have to meet uh, reserves, uh, reserve margin, and spinning and non-spinning reserves? <laughs> So the stacked bars represent uh, different elements of the portfolio. Uh, you've got your nuclear at the bottom, the hydro contracts that exist, uh, the different elements of uh, renewables that we've been talking about, the landfill gas, your existing combined cycle share at Magnolia, uh, plus potential new combined cycle at IPP. Uh, we have in red uh, the possibility for distributed local solar, uh, and up top some contract positions that you have. And then in the middle of those, uh, what's going on at Grayson? And you can see the differences there in, in light yellow and gold in terms of whether there's a combined cycle, a simple cycle. So a couple points here. First of all, the run to fail scenario you can see does not meet peak load uh, with native resources. Uh, it's not going to hit reliability uh, requirements and hence is, is gonna pose a risk from that point of view. Uh, the other options, though, uh, each hit the requirement with reserves uh, with varying levels of capacity. But that doesn't necessarily uh, <coughs> indicate where the energy is coming from, which is shown on slide 17. And what this indicates is where does the energy resource balance out with the energy need over time on the left-hand side 2020 and on the right-hand side 2030. So whereas capacity is simply what's available, uh, these are the megawatts that are available to us, this is our expected peak demand, this slide here shows where is that energy coming from. Just because the megawatts are available doesn't mean that it's necessarily the most efficient way of generating electricity from the system. So in this picture, what we show is under the simulation analysis that's been done, where is the energy coming from in each of the families? And in 2020, you can see a more near-term view uh, and then in 2030, a more long-term view of what the portfolio could evolve into. So by 2030, you'll see uh, a major shift from coal into natural gas. You'll also see uh, the light blue at the top representing uh, the Schuyler contract and resources that you will have at that point in time, which are offset by sales in 2020. And you'll also see that a couple of the portfolios, notably 200C and 250D, have quite a bit more energy than that hashed horizontal line which represents your need. And the 
simple way to think about that is those portfolios have larger opportunities for excess market sales uh, off to the spot market or to a potential bilateral counterparty. Uh, so the need is in that hash line, but the resources that are in the system uh, can still be dispatched economically throughout the wider footprint uh, of your balancing area and, and beyond to potentially meet resource needs elsewhere and sell that power off to uh, another entity. So are, are those potential market sales factored in the economics of calculating and costing out the different options for, yes. for those portfolios? Okay. Yes, they are. And that's a good transition, actually, to the, the next slide on the analysis framework. Uh, so we've just built up a lot of uh, information on the screening concept and the portfolio development. And now we're moving to step three on that first slide that Gary reviewed. Uh, so we've gone over identifying key objectives, key metrics, go through a whole screening process and a resource evaluation process to look at what's out there, what's cost effective, what kind of concepts can we, can, can we develop, uh, and then go through a more <coughs> detailed portfolio assessment uh, with all of the variables incorporated. So this is step three, analyzing the costs, risks, using the IRP tools that we're outlining here. So this is a schematic of, of the process. Uh, on the left-hand side in blue, uh, you'll see a lot of information about existing plant parameters, the portfolio options, your regional footprint and transmission interconnections. Point being here that uh, at a very granular level, we've got all the elements associated with operating the system in, in the simulation that's going to be performed. That includes capacities, heat rates, operational costs, uh, contract costs, uh, contract parameters uh, to the hourly level of granularity. On the top, in green, we've got various external market drivers. Uh, what impacts the cost of operating the portfolio? Fuel prices, emission prices, uh, load growth uh, for GWP, but also externally, uh, other parts of the, uh, the California system. Capital costs of new build. Uh, what do those new additions actually cost over time? And each of those external factors uh, also come into the simulation tool. And within that market analysis, uh, there's an hourly dispatch going on, an attempt to simulate the operations of the system. Uh, there's builds and retirements in the market, and there's an ability to capture uh, both purchases and sales in a condition where uh, the portfolio may have more energy than is needed. Uh, so all that is being dynamically evaluated. And on the, the output side, we can look at power prices, generation of the plants, and portfolio costs. What are the all-in costs of running this portfolio? What does it cost to build? What does it cost to operate and maintain? What kind of fuel has to be spent? Uh, what are the contract costs? What are the revenues I may get from selling elsewhere? Uh, and so on. So that's the key framework. As is noted here, and as was referenced before, um, up at the top there, there are several scenarios that have been evaluated. And at this point, before we go into the results, we'll just spend a couple minutes talking about those scenarios. So to evaluate across a wide range of potential market conditions, uh, we've first developed a reference case and then three additional stress test cases uh, to look at these different portfolios. The reference case is reflective of current expectations in the market, uh, gas price forecast, current carbon and RPS rules, uh, what the carbon prices in the market will look like, uh, how RPS compliance will need to be met, uh, what your base load growth uh, will be, and so on. From that reference case, we've stress tested the three distinct possible states of the world. Uh, first of all, on the, on the left in gray, a status quo inertia concept. This is an idea where gas prices stay very low, carbon and RPS regulation stays where it is, uh, doesn't strengthen at all. Um, because of that, energy costs remain low, and solar PV penetration uh, from behind the meter at the distributed level is less, although customer counts go up a little bit. To the right, that green scenario is very much the opposite of several of those drivers. Uh, in this scenario, CO2 regulations strengthen and allowance prices increase. Uh, this is a pretty good proxy for the recent uh, announcement by the governor to uh, pursue a 40 percent 
carbon reduction after AB 32 by 2030. Uh, this scenario also envisions a RPS being raised to 50 percent, uh, again by the 2025 to 2030 time period. And simultaneously, uh, due to additional demand for natural gas nationwide, uh, due to stricter environmental regulations, and also production and fracking restrictions, you've got higher gas prices. And then the final scenario is more of a technology-driven uh, scenario, uh, considered the transformation case. Uh, this is where <coughs> technology improvements in solar, uh, battery costs, uh, are much uh, greater than expected, and this drives significant amounts of solar PV penetration at the distributed level. It also drives uh, more electric vehicle penetration. And this is also the scenario where we embed the time of use rate analysis that Gary referenced before. Uh, so in this scenario, you've got a, a bit of a transformation in how electricity is being used uh, across the day through rate structure changes and uh, new penetration of both electric vehicle load, uh, but also eroding load from distributed uh, generation uh, solar slash battery deployment. So on slide 20, very briefly, uh, we've already kind of covered that, but if you want to take a quick snapshot of how the various uh, costs stack up to each other, uh, you can look in the status quo inertia case. The bottom line here is lower gas prices, lower carbon prices, lower solar PV penetration, but slightly higher load growth. On the green case, it's all about higher carbon prices, higher gas prices, uh, higher RPS. And then in transformation, we don't have changes to gas and carbon outlooks necessarily, but more solar PV penetration due to lower technology costs, <coughs> a real change in the load profile. Uh, peak loads go down due to the time of use rate, uh, but due to off-peak electric vehicle charging, the overall sales associated with uh, GWP service territory go up. So I'll pause here. Uh, this kind of covers all the inputs, uh, the key portfolio analyses that were done, and um, turn it back over to Gary to go over the results unless there are any comments or questions. Okay, he left it for me to go to the complex slides, so I'm going to have to take a minute to, to explain this one. So if you, this is, remember when I talked about the fact that there are four or five different objectives that are to be met, you'll see them across the top of the screen. The, uh, across the top you see cost, risk and rate stability, liability, environmental stewardship, flexibility and financial. Those are the objectives that we talked about at the very beginning. The metrics that I outlined, which was the first step, are in the are right below that. Excuse me. Oh, I'm Just sorry. Phone call. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so you'll see right below the the top line are the metrics that we talked about in also in step one, which are the levelized net present value of costs, the worst case scenario, which is a risk item the reliance on the market, which is another risk item, and then the reliability metrics, the total CO2 emissions, and the total capital requirements. So you'll see all of those metrics uh, across each of the different portfolios that Pat talked about. The nine portfolios are laid out going down the page from run to fail for, for Grayson to the eight other options basically for Grayson repowering and the combinations with renewables. Um, so what you'll see are the, the various categories, and what we've done is we've filled in the values for each one of those. Uh, so for a cost, basically the run to fail, the average over the 20-year period, the average dollar per megawatt hour is uh, $103.9 per megawatt hour. And then you can read down for each one of the other options, and you'll be able to see on a relative basis, and we've labeled them, we've color coordinated them or color coded them from lowest cost to highest cost. The lowest cost ones are in green, the highest costs are in red, and in between is in some shades of yellow. So you can immediately see, in the, if you're just focused on least cost for the moment, Notice that the run to fail with uh, Grayson is at about $104 versus somewhere between $94 and $96, 
which is about a 10% difference associated with the grace and repowering option, which is quite significant in, in the context of net present values over a period of time. That's 10% every year over 20 years. So that adds up to a significant difference. So you can see there's a real value associated with repowering. As you look across uh, the worst case, basically we just described four scenarios. We listed all of those and we took the highest cost scenario across those four scenarios to say how bad could it get, which is one measure of risk. Again, you'll see that the, uh, the 250 D scenario, which is basically the two combined cycle scenario, uh, has the lowest cost and it has the lowest cost in the worst case. So it's consistently the lowest cost option. The run to fail is consistently the highest cost option. And then you'll see a stream in between. The reliance on the market, which is uh, one measure of risk, actually looks different. So. You may recall when we were comparing a couple of slides ago, and I'll try and see if when I, when I go back, and you look at the energy needs, you'll see that a number of these in 2020 and just slightly more in 20, uh, 2030, they basically just meet the peak load. Whereas when you get to the higher, uh, uh, the, the larger uh, plant uh, options for Grayson, you'll <coughs> notice that those have excess capacity to sell into the market. So when you come back to look at the reliance on the market as a percentage of the total portfolio cost, you'll see that it's just the opposite. So the ones that have the lowest cost have the highest amount of market reliability or reliance on the market on a percentage basis. I'll talk about in a minute how you can mitigate that through a partner, or when I say a partner, basically if you can contract with another supplier on a bilateral basis, you can avoid being in the market, so you can avoid that risk through a contract situation. Okay. The next one is reliability. You already saw a graph that showed that the run to fail doesn't meet the, the requirements overall. We also, in the loss of load study, we basically looked at whether it met the NERC requirement of only one um, incidence of not meeting load in 10 years. And consistently, the run to fail scenario does not meet that criteria. The 150B uh, scenario is borderline. So if you look at it in 2019, and it, I haven't shown the percentages here as to how often whether you meet the one in 10 year requirement. But in 2019, the calculation that we've showed there, which is 186 megawatts lost, that's about a 1.1 incidence in 10 years uh, when done on a probability weighted basis. So that's very marginal. Over time, as you get to 2030, that actually uh, meets the requirement. It's down to about uh, uh, 0.5 uh, instead of so that that's under the one in 10 year requirement. So those are the only ones that are of a concern from a reliability standpoint. All the others are green basically because they easily meet the, the NERC requirement for reliability. So if you're concerned about that, the run to fail is a major concern. The 150 is of concern. It's kind of marginal and it's a risk. Environmental stewardship, they all, uh, all the portfolios meet the 33% RPS, but from a, a total emissions for Glendale only, and I, I emphasize that because I'm going to qualify that in a second, you'll see that the larger, uh, uh, the larger units, the 250, just because they're larger, for one thing, is that they're going to have higher CO2 emissions. But uh, I, I restrict that or I, I caution because basically if you think about how that's actually going to play in the, the broader California market, this is a very efficient unit. It will <coughs> operate in the market and it will push out less efficient units. So there's a chance that while if you just look at Glendale only, the emission levels for CO2 will go up, if you're looking at California as a whole, it could actually go down. 
So we've got that as a yellow, uh, but, but that, depending upon how you look at it, that could actually, you could think of that as a different color. And then the financial stability standpoint, uh, again, the larger the unit, the more capital you're going to need. Uh, but you, once again, if you partner, or when I say partner, I mean contract with someone on a bilateral basis and they pay a demand charge, that could actually reduce the requirements associated with the capital expenditures. Also, Glendale has uh, low debt rates, and as long as they can, uh, as long as they can borrow a sufficient amount without affecting their financial metrics, uh, you know, their capital ratios and, and, and other sorts of financial ratios, this might not be as important because we're already building the larger capital component into the cost metric. It's already embedded in the least cost metric. So it is larger, but it's still lowest cost. So across the board, what we've done uh, one of the things that we, you notice is that each one of those is a pair. The 150 has wind and solar, and then it has wind, solar, and geothermal. So if you actually compare those two lines, you'll see that the wind, solar, and geothermal, which is a more diverse portfolio, across every single one of these is higher, is lower cost than the wind and solar on its own. So basically, what we've done is we've eliminated the run to fail because it doesn't meet the reliability constraint, and we've eliminated the wind and solar and left it with the more diverse portfolios, which takes us down to four, <clears throat> okay? All right, and so the, the next thing that we've done is uh, we have, We've shown what the costs are for, this is the reference case only. We'll show that first and then I'll show you the sensitivity studies. But for the reference case only, this basically shows what the costs are as a function of time. Because in some instances when you do a net present value, you don't always get a, a true picture of what happens in the early years versus the later years. And sometimes people think the early years matter more than the later years because there's more uncertainty in the future. But this basically shows that the top line, which is the run to fail, is consistently the high cost option over every year of the study. It's close over the next couple of years, but I think I mentioned that overall there's about a 10% difference across the 20 year period on a net present value basis. It's actually greater than that when you look beyond 2018, 2019 because uh, it's, it's fairly narrow in the first few years and then it, 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 it grows pretty rapidly. So that's consistently the high cost. The others has pretty consistent trends where the uh, 250D wind, solar, and geothermal is the lowest cost across all of those, but recognize that part of that is because they're selling into the market and driving the cost down. This shows the range of costs across the four scenarios. So the, uh, the reference is the black diamonds. Uh, and then, as you can see, we've intentionally tried to put <coughs> bounding scenarios and kind of push plausible but more limiting scenarios on both sides. The green ones, which is the green scenario, has the very high environmental costs. The low cost basically has low gas prices and low power prices forever. So you can sort of see where, uh, where these occur across all the scenarios. But the thing that is, is quite clear is that across all of those scenarios, if you look at the 250D scenario, it is the lowest cost in every one of the four scenarios. The run to fail is the highest cost in every one of the four scenarios. And basically, uh, in between, there is a uh, uh, the the simple cycle options are generally higher cost than the combined cycle options because of the efficiencies and the heat rates. So um, you, you you get a pretty consistent pattern as you're looking across these. Whether you're looking year by year, you're looking uh, across the various scenarios. So the the, the findings that we've come up with. Repeating what I've said, but putting it into words, is that run to fail is always highest cost. The 250D portfolio with the two combined cycles is lowest. Um, 
It, the 250D offers a hedge against high market prices, so therefore it avoids the worst co cost uh, outcome. Uh, it is also the lowest cost there. But it does, uh, and it provides insurance against some catastrophes where you would need the power and you'd have plants down and things like that. Um, the, by 2020, it relies heavily on market sales, and that's why we're recommending that you would want to at least offload a portion of that load uh, for purposes of reducing the reliance on the market. <laughs> From a reliability standpoint, I mentioned the, the two that are uh, the, the, the worst in terms of reliability are the run to fail and the, the 150B portfolio. And then uh, the, we talked about the environmental uh, footprint on CO2 emissions, which is highest by the 250, but it may be lower than uh, others in the California market. As far as the uh, landfill gas, uh, I'm going to repeat some of the things that Pat said earlier. Basically, Existing combustion at Grayson is inefficient. The heat rate is about 14,000, uh, well, well above what it would be to put new combustion equipment on, online at the Shoal Canyon site. Pipeline uh, transportation to coal to Shoal Canyon, uh, from Shoal Canyon to Grayson, is subject to increasing regulatory risk. Think about this, when it was first put in, it was in the early 90s. The, the regulatory requirements for pipelines and the attention that it gets these days is much higher than it was then, and that's just going to continue to get worse. Um, separating the combustion from Grayson and moving it to Shoal Canyon avoids tens of millions, uh, estimated $50 million, 50 to $60 million by Stantec in terms of air emission permit costs. Apparently, if you, if you put it if you put it on the site, you can potentially get a waiver from some of the emission uh, requirements to offset, uh, and, and so you would not have to do offsets. Those permitting costs have been estimated in the 50 to $60 million range, uh, which is very, very high. Installing uh, efficient combustion can, can double the renewable energy. Uh, the avoided costs are actually uh, greater than the incremental cost in the analysis that we've done, which would minimize the, any potential rate impact. And so we highly recommend moving uh, the combustion to Shoal Canyon. Other recommended actions, um, I think we've shown that in every, uh, every evaluation uh, across all scenarios uh, and portfolios, Repowering is a much better option than uh, the run to fail. Um, and we also recommend that you look for a, when I say partner, I mean a contracting uh, agent, not necessarily an ownership uh, partnership for part, part of the plant. Um, proceed with the building the generation at Shoal Canyon. Uh, the RPS compliance, you're already, uh, Glendale is already in good shape by 2020 but they will be losing some wind power uh, by 2030, and so th some things have to be done. But by retiring the Grayson boilers, increasing energy from the landfill gas, and some additional renewables combined with repowering Grayson, that looks like a good option for meeting the, the RPS requirements. Um, Pat pointed out that the inter-hour analysis on energy storage hasn't been completed yet. That should be done and will be done in, in the next month or two. And with regard to capacity, trans, uh, transmission capacity, um, continue to study the new transmission connection to see if those risks can be controlled and you can actually achieve those savings. But it's too early to make that comment at this point. So we basically, the fallback option is to continue to presume that you'll be dealing with LADWP. And finally, um, with regard to coal replacement, uh, the San Juan replacement will occur in 2017. So uh, you will have sufficient adequate resources in that time frame. And if you need any additional, you can get that from the market. We're not recommending any, uh, any uh, uh, changes from that strategy. 
develop the options for IPP renewal. Um, not totally under Glendale's control with regard to what gets built there because it's a joint owned <coughs> station. But there are some options with regard to transmission rights that can be negotiated and those, uh, those should be evaluated. Uh, with regard to uh, GHG compliance, the strategy that we've outlined actually will allow you to build inventory of free allowances between now and 2020 and that's actually valuable because our expectation is that once the free allowances go away, that the cost associated with allowances will go up and go up faster than the cost of debt, which would suggest that hold, building and holding allowances for that time frame makes sense. A retail rates, um, we've done a high level analysis of uh, time of use rates, but there are lots of options besides time of use rates. Uh, we think that and we recommend that uh, consideration of time of use, real time, uh, demand charge, a number of other options can be evaluated and probably could, should be evaluated to make use of the meters that you already have, which is a tremendous benefit relative to most of the state of California. And community outreach, uh, uh, develop a messaging strategy. CEQA compliance requires that anybody who's affected by uh, these options uh, needs to be advised and uh, and go through a stakeholder process and so we recommend that that occurs as well and with that I'll open it up for questions question uh, uh, one of the things I, I noticed that you guys didn't include any biomass or waste to energy options uh, can you I'm assuming you looked at it in some yes way. that was one of the those were options that were evaluated in the screening uh, process and we looked at, at biomass in particular. <coughs> Geothermal is also a base load option that appears to be cheaper. And there's also, with regard to a lot of the biomass, it's very hard for the, the size that you want, the fuel associated, uh, acquiring the fuel uh, is, uh, is always an option when you're looking at biomass. It has to be local to be economic and it, it wasn't clear that that was the case. In addition, we're looking at smaller biomass projects separately process to put something actual or with a developer so we're talking to firms right now okay I, I, I bring so it's up, active we have we yeah. have not ignored that I option. bring up the qu the question because of show resource right. being right yeah. in our backyard um, I, I see uh, what is being recommended and um, so what what is the process are you uh, are we taking this to City Council and when yes, yes. okay so we're gonna make this very same presentation more or less to the City Council and the the objective is to ask for their direction so okay. is it um, would they like us to retire the plant run to fail or take one of the options that you see once once they've made that decision let's just assume for discussion purposes it's one of the repower options then we'll begin to pursue that with our op or operating or our um, owner's engineer uh, and begin by by no means there will be a number of times that we come back for review for mm -hmm. updates for further uh, direction from the council uh, as we go through this you heard uh, the, the, these gentlemen did a great job in presenting this, but some of the, the devils in the details and <coughs> from permitting to buying the equipment, uh, these things take time and uh, they are not easy by any means. So it's not simply a matter of saying, we, yeah, go build the 250 and we'll see you in five years kind of thing. So, so right now we're just looking for um, direction in, should we repower Grayson? And if we if we are, what's the recommendation on the options to repower Grayson? So we will get uh, an answer this year, and we're looking at uh, possibly starting the repowering 2022. I think the repowering could be in place as early as 2019, based upon 19. The plan. Okay. So um, we're looking at a four to five year process. I've been saying five because I just want to make sure that we're not. I see. I'm looking at um, chart page six. So um, if we were to uh, have that in place by 2019, <coughs> that uh, orange, how would that affect that orange bar? Well, basically, you'd be left, uh, let me find page. Page six. Because that shows that um, the, the big drop from Grayson starts in 2022. Right. Remember... 
right? Mm -hmm. Remember, this is the run to fail case. So basically, um, it will look quite different. And I, we've got another slide later that basically shows what they are under the various scenarios in terms of both the, um, the capacity and also the energy cost that Pat showed. So uh, what this will look more like, let me see if I can. Okay, so under these scenarios, when you're looking at, at this, is, this is only 2030. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're gonna see that the, um, the, the 150B and the 200B and <coughs> these scenarios have a different percentage and basically the only Grayson Unit 9 will be left, which is 50 megawatts. So basically, by 2019 in these scenarios, and I, I don't have that in a 2020 snapshot, but basically what you'll see is that by 2020, only 50 megawatts of Grayson will be left and it will be replaced with the repowered Grayson, the whichever option, which would be the 250 whichever. logically, okay. right. And so if you look at the energy needs, what that will do, it, depending upon which one you select, you'll sort of see what's left of Grayson, which I'm trying to look at the color. Uh, existing Grayson is kind of orange, and that's, that's 50 megawatt, that's a 50 megawatt slice, which doesn't show up very much in, the, in this graph. But you can see that's the energy, and that's actually the dispatch. That's not the capacity, but that's the dispatch of how much of that will be used, which will probably be even, even less. Okay. And you did the chart for 2020, and, and that's, I guess, consistent with what you're saying, that the, the intention is to have it go in 2019? As, or, early, or as early, the earlier that you can get it in, right. the more you will save. So in effect, uh, if you can get it in by 2019, and you can do, get through the permitting and the process and the evaluation, you will be able to save more. Any? I just have a quick question. <clears throat> in the past, we mentioned that Shoal Canyon landfill gas potentially could be converted into pipeline quality gas to be injected. Is that an option still? Yes, that was actually evaluated. And I think, as, as you heard um, the discussion, the issue we're facing is the pipeline itself. So when we looked at, at converting the Shoal Canyon gas into pipeline quality, then putting it in the pipeline and shipping it down to Grayson or, or mixing it at some point, and it could, you know, we even talked about it could go to, to Magnolia. The problem came in our pipeline. That pipeline, when it was installed, regulations were different. That was a landfill gas, a methane pipeline that maybe fell through the cracks if you want. Well, it's a different story today. And the, and the permitting, the maintenance, um, the regulations required by the Department of Transportation, to, to, to name a few, have, would be so cumbersome that it is more cost effective for us to just take that, that <coughs> gas and use it right at, uh, at, at the site for savings of everything from the permit costs to transportation and we can get the, the energy right there and double our, I think one of the, the key things is for for me is you know a potential 50 million dollar savings let's even be really you know let's cut that in half and say it's a 25 million dollar savings but doubling our our rps credit that's that's really critical so when we looked at all those things and we did we actually had an rfp out separately to 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 make the gas pipeline quality but it didn't pencil out from a cost benefit perspective and that, that's something that showed up early on. You can yes. correct me if that's I'm wrong. That's right. It was I know I, I, they talked to me pretty early on and said, you know, we may not even want to go any further pursuing that um, because it's just the cost is it's going to be uh, very, very prohibitive. And there's a couple of other options that, uh, that we might want to look at. And at that point in time, they hadn't even fully uh, advised me about the permitting and the doubling of the renewables. That alone almost seals the deal when it comes to, to looking at this. But it's a valuable resource. We certainly want to use it. And I think we want to use it in the most cost-effective manner we can and to get the greatest bang for our buck from uh, the uh, environmental mandates we're under. I said that. Absolutely. Um, my only question is uh, whether you factored in a 50% RPS requirement as part of the modeling. Um, the governor announced it in the state of the state address, and I think the Senate president has a bill. 
Right. So, uh, as Pat pointed out, we did uh, we built it into the to one of that's in the green scenario. In the in the green scenario, that's reflected in our green scenario. Uh, basically, we have a much higher price of carbon built into that. That is a reflection of our best estimate of what the impact of that would be. Got it. And, and Madam President, and members of the, of the commission, just a couple of notes I took, and please, Lon, or correct me, but you know there was the um, the talk of the transmission, which, which as you all know, is a very, very critical issue, and the assumption that if we had our local generation was to go down to the 150 range, we'd have to to look at increasing our transmission capacity, which we could either rent from LA or or construct through the Kaiso and SEE. Um, that assumes we could rent it from LA. And that is an assumption. I'm looking at lawn. That's not a guarantee. <coughs> so it's not like we can just go knock on Ellie's door and say, we need 50 megawatts and write a check. It may be a case of, we don't have 50 megawatts. Um, so then what do we do? Uh, and I think we're all seeing right now the limitations on transmission and where that puts us uh, at, at somewhat of a disadvantage. Not somewhat, it's more than somewhat of a disadvantage. And when you look at where our options are then to bring power in from other, other places, it, it's very limited. So I only throw that out there. I just want to make sure that folks understand it's not as easy as just, like I said, calling up L.A. and saying we need 50, we need 75, we need 100. Because right now we're finding out that they're looking at us saying we don't have it. And if we did have it, we need it. Um, there may be some available down the road but no guarantee that we'd have uh, access to that. So I just want to be cautious that we don't, that we take that into consideration. That, that, that's not a, a given by, by any chance, by any stretch, excuse me. Um, is this the, the first study that a GWP has that's it's like this, to, to this degree? Yes, the first of my knowledge that we've ever done. It's, um, I can tell you that in the past they have looked at repowering efforts, so I don't know to what extent those reports, mm -hmm. um, what, what detail they were in as far as looking at uh, everything from the renewables to IPP to those kind of things. It, it, we haven't done one uh, you know, this comprehensive. Well, um Given how uh, detailed it is and how complicated it is and how long it is, um, I, I, I think I understood it. And um, but I would appreciate to have this like earlier next time, as we indicated earlier. Um, do the rest of the commissioners have any other questions or comments? No. Okay. Um, let's see. I think we have. Oh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, we have. Um, let's see the next speaker. Uh, for me, uh, Mr. Larry Morehouse, please. And Madam President, while this is coming up, let me just add, there had been some discussion as you look at um, the options depending on which um, recommendation you would make. There was discussion about at that 250 megawatt looking at put the potential to have partners, partners in some way, whether it's somebody that we have a sales agreement with. That's something that we have been looking at and talking to already. Oh, already. Uh, other utilities who might be interested. Very preliminary, but we have other other local utilities who are able to, we're able to bring the power to. So we, those discussions have started. That's a very real possibility. Okay, great, thank you. Good afternoon, Commission. My name's Larry Morehouse. I'm a retired GWP employee. I used to be the manager of the Grayson Power Plant since 1988. I retired in 2008. Everything you see at Grayson, even today, I was probably heavily involved with uh, the way it looks today and, and even how it's running today. Uh, I had a lot of questions on this report, but after listening to these gentlemen from PACE, uh, they answered a lot of my questions. They have a lot of information that really isn't in this, this report, but apparently a lot of information that supports what they're saying, and I, and I have a lot of appreciation for that. And also, I have a big appreciation for the, the uh, task and the challenges that Mr. Zern has to make all of this work, along with the water problems he has. He's got a big load on his hand. So I do appreciate that. Um, I've always been a supporter of, of Glendale being its own power generator. So 
that's one of the reasons I'm here. I'm not here to criticize, but maybe if I can offer some of my uh, knowledge from the past and what have you, why it's available. But uh, some of the questions that, that I have is, is when, when Glendale put in the smart meter, one of the first things I asked, and I think I asked Mr. Zern, good, are we going to see time of use rates? And he said, not at this time. Well, that disappointed me because the whole purpose of the smart meter that was developed all the way across the United States of America was to be able to design your rates where you could, you know, you could maybe peel off some of these peak loads that these power plant people had to build for just for an hour or two hour a day. Now, Glendale has two peaks a day, one around 10 o'clock and the other one around five or six when everybody comes home. So here we are, we're talking about a $300 million project to be able to meet these peak loads. And these gentlemen right here have already said it's very possible <clears throat> if you use your new meter that you already bought and paid for uh, and, and took a, take a look at time of use rate, you might be able to make this project look a little bit different and you might even be able to save some money on some of this generation and transmission that you're talking about, let alone environmental issues. You don't have to wait five or 10 years to have a time of use rate. So why are we putting it in, a, in with a project that's going to take five or 10 years? The time of use rate ought to be now. <coughs> and maybe, maybe they are. I don't know. I'm not saying they're not. But if I, was on, if I was in your seat, I would be saying, we want to take a look at this time of use right now. We want to see what the study says and how much we can defer of generation that we're going to have to spend millions of dollars for at the power plant. When I worked at the power plant, I'd go out in the power plant and I said, if this was my power plant, uh, I knew it was old. There's no question about it that at some day it was going to have to be replaced. I was born in 1938, so was the Grayson Power Plant. We were the same age, so I could understand it. Years ago, I told Ginger Bremberg that it's very possible that we may be seeing a unit that's 100 years old running here, and everybody laughed at me. Well, if you do the math, you're not very far from that right now. So uh, another question I had in any additional generation at Grayson, did Pace Global uh, talk to the gas company to see if the fuel, gas fuel supply was in San Fernando Road. When we put in Unit 9, we had a lot of meetings about that. And, and uh, if my memory serves me correct, there wasn't a lot of gas in San Fernando Road to do too much more generation at Grayson. So I don't know whether that's been done, but I'd recommend that you do that. The other thing at the airway, uh, airway station has... Uh, when I came to work there, they had two transformers. One of them failed, and it really put the city in a bind. They had to go out to emergency purchase and buy a transformer that had to be built in South Korea. It took a year to get it. Now we have three transformers there. But if we're talking about more generation, less repower, there needs to be another transformer in that airway station. And I think Mr. Ramon will probably tell you that. If you lose one, you're in trouble. So you can do a lot of things on paper that make it look like, well, this is what you need to do. But I've worked 50 years with the power companies, and I know in the real world, sometimes on paper, it doesn't work out that way. So the choices that the commission uh, makes, along with the city council, has to be right on the nose, because you could spend a lot of money here and be making some wrong decisions. I object. I would object to being in a partnership with. Uh, my time's out. I know. I would object to being in a partnership. I think Glendale needs to have their own generation. They need to put in smaller units. Uh, the load in Glendale drops down to about 60 megawatts at night. During the peak, it could be 300. So you have to have a unit that you can ratchet down at night. If you have a big unit up here, like they do Magnolia, I was involved in that, where are you going to, where are you going to put the load? 
you got to have a customer out there. Uh, can you wrap that up, please? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much you for your comment and, and your service. No, I appreciate the comments by um, by Mr. Morehouse, and those are things. That's why this this kind of a project doesn't play, take place overnight. And it's why one decision to move forward doesn't mean that's an absolute yes. Uh, and as we run into different things, we it may need and we may need to adjust. Uh, time of use is certainly something we're looking at. Time of use and distributed generation are the hot topics in the electrical industry now, and everybody who uh, you know seems to have a different opinion and is an expert on it. So we, we've we've tried to to while keep it very much uh, uh, a focus of ours. We're also trying to look at what some of the other folks are doing. So I don't know if Mr. Peters wants to comment where we are with any kind of time and use right now, but I mean we're, it's it's part of what we're looking at. He's happy, so he must want to come up and talk about it. We won't make him do that because he's <laughs> um, so. The, but it's a very valid point. Uh, from the electrical side of things, I'm sure Ramon is chomping at the bit to tell you that, yeah, whatever, whatever transformers or upgrades need to be done at the plant to accommodate the, the repowering are all integrated into the plant. And so once the owner's engineer gets a hold of this, all of that from the racks the substations, where the power goes, all of those things are part of the overall repowering. It's not just a matter of taking the 39 unit and replacing it with a 2015 or 16 or 17 unit. There's a lot more that goes into it. So the electrical engineering component of that is very much married, integrated with with the uh, the actual construction of the of the new plant, and, and the other comment was uh, regarding the gas supply. So that again is something that we would we would evaluate uh, as we go through this. Uh, so that's, you know, certainly we wouldn't want to build a plant that we couldn't get enough fuel to. So that's, a, again, a very valid point and one we, we, we will take a look at. I don't know, Ramon, if you wanted to comment in detail, because he looks like he wants to talk about transformers. Uh, good evening. Uh, yeah, part, we have an owner's engineer. One of the things we're looking at, these are just the options. We haven't gone to the design part. As we go through the design, we go through the permitting before we even touch the site, all those things will be identified. We're looking at all, all the transmission requirements. The transformers, we have 450 megawatt capacity from, from airway. Uh, if we build this plant, we'll be very close to not meeting our N minus one condition. So those design parameters are being considered. So what you haven't seen are the details behind it. We haven't decide, decided the size of the wires, everything, but all of these are being will be considered as part of the uh, owner's engineer as we go through the actual design. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item, please. Uh, 4C Water Conservation Update, Michael DeGhetto. Uh, more speaker? Did, was there another speaker? Was there another card? card? Uh, there is, but I thought the other cards, uh, 4C. 4C. There was a 4A. And then uh, Mr. Morehouse did 4B, and the third one is 4C. Who's the 4C for, 4C Madam Madam is Mr. Harry Zavos. I have no questions on 4C. Oh, so you're we just change it to 4B, 4B. for him? Okay, yes. we'll change that to 4B. And I can vouch for Mr. Zavos. I knew that's the oh, okay. item he wanted sure. to talk about. Yeah, okay. Uh, Robo answered my question for 4C. And mm -hmm. uh, let me say that uh, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, so I'm here being very dangerous. Uh, but uh, I would uh, recommend that you have the man that appeared before me at this podium uh, has spent his whole life in the utility business. Start out uh, in the Rickover program with Atomic Subs, has an institutional memory of that yard for 20 years. Uh, he is interested in that plant and he's interested in uh, Glendale having its own generation plant and it just seems to me that in the course of this planning phase it would be behoove the city to take advantage of that institutional knowledge as well as experience and have him involved in the planning process raising the kind of questions he raised in terms of how much gas supply was to run uh, uh, unit 9 and whether or not that supply is available if you go to an additional uh, 250 megawatt system. Uh, it just seems to me that that is a valuable resource and I would urge you to consider some way of having him involved so that the consultants can get the value of his experience and knowledge. Uh, much of what I've learned about the 
uh, electric transformation, uh, transforming at the plant has been from him. And uh, one of the things that he brought up, and I've done some research on my own, I noticed that all the proposals uh, involve a GE 50 megawatt gas turbine generating machine. And apparently there is a LMS 100 GA, GE gas turbine uh, generator, which apparently is highly efficient. It allows you to plan for peak periods because apparently you can power down the amount of electrical output output without uh, losing efficiency. And I just wonder whether or not uh, consideration was given to configurations using that, uh, that uh, gas turbine uh, instead of the uh, LM6000, which only puts out 100 megawatts. And one additional advantage of that, apparently, is that it's the only recognized advanced ca uh, uh, gas turbine from the AQMD, which has the advantage of allowing you to transfer uh, uh, south coast west permitting in terms of the amount of pollutants you can put in from existing units to uh, a LMS 100. Uh, and with that, that's all I have to say, but I, I do think you ought to take, take advantage of this resource here. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Zavos. Any? And to what um, what degree that ends up coming about, we'll, we'll see. But there may <coughs> actually, you know, a ad hoc small committee. It may be going out into different areas. We may be bringing in a test group and talking to them. Some of you may be familiar with how we did that with the rate structures, yes. where we brought in working groups before we even went out uh, to the public. So those are kind of things that we're considering under that. And I think Mr. Morehouse would be a great. Okay. asset there as we involve the community in this. Yeah. On the second question, um, certainly I'll preface it because Mr. Peters does want to talk about this particular one. Um, preface it by saying, as, as you heard, for purposes of, of putting the report together, they, they chose a couple different types of, of equipment. That doesn't limit us to those, those pieces of equipment. But specifically about uh, type of units, um, I think Lon has an answer for that uh, of why one was considered over the other. Yes, I, I, I think I can briefly address it. The, we looked at an LMS 100. It's a 100 megawatt unit. The LM 6000s are 50 megawatt units. The turndown, that is the, that is the minimum load that you could put on an LMS 100, is 50 megawatts. So if you either turn it on and you run it between 50 and 100, or you turn it off. That 50 megawatt minimum is a bit of a problem for a city the size of Glendale. If we were Los Angeles, it would be very different. We, you know, Los Angeles has six or eight of LMS 100s, but an LMS 100 is actually a pretty big, big unit for a city the size of Glendale. And with respect to permitting, the other point that was made by Mr. Zavos, we, um, Stantec has a subcontractor who's a specialist in AQMD permitting issues, and they've developed a strategy for permitting to try to minimize the cost of getting the air permits from AQMD. And the option that Mr. Zavos mentioned is certainly one option, but there are three or four other options that are being explored to make sure that we can maximize the transferability of the existing air permits to the new equipment. And it's also one of the reasons why we uh, propose to move the landfill gas generation up to Shoal Canyon to minimize that cost as well. So we have looked at uh, all of these issues, and we'll continue to look at them. Okay. Thank you. Next item, please. 4C is water conservation update. Michael DeGetta. So, Madam President, members of the commission, as we promised, we will be back every, every month to give you the latest on the drought. Uh, there's been a lot of activity. We gave you a drought update report, a little bit more detailed than we normally do, have done because it, it was a growing issue. And in that one month period, there's been, as I said, a flurry of activity up in Sacramento that caused us to take some some uh, pretty immediate action. So Michael's just going to go through with you. Uh, some of this may be redundant because it's been in the, in the press so much, but you'll see some of the, the legislation that's been handed down and then some of the things that we're doing in the city of Glendale, not only from the perspective of um, our mandatory conservation, 
and what potential enforcement, but also some things the city's doing on the, uh, as, as a utility customer ourselves to try to set the example and reduce uh, water. So I'll let him Thank you. quickly go through that because I know it's a late evening for you. Madam President, members of the commission, my name is Michael DeGhetto. I'm the assistant general manager for water at Glendale Water and Power. And I'm going to give a drought update. Uh, <clears throat> so as everyone knows, we're in, in a very serious drought. Uh, snow level and snowpack and, the, and our sources are, are impacted by that. Uh, the governor signed an executive order, uh, statewide 25% reductions, and it's mandatory. Um, and our reduction set at 20% for the city of Glendale. Um, and also uh, our major supplier, Metropolitan Water District, uh, set an allocation, um, which is a 15% reduction in their supplies uh, starting July 1st. So our response has been to uh, recommend to the city council who moved uh, the city to phase three of our mandatory conservation ordinance um, while delaying the drought charge for that stage for six months. And, and what this phase three does, some of the main things is it limits outside watering to two days a week, uh, Tuesday and Saturday for 10 minutes in, on each station. And then plus, you know, the other restrictions are always in effect, basically like the no water waste restrictions. Um, <clears throat> and those are the different phases. So we're in phase three now. Uh, and to meet that 20% target, uh, what this graph shows, it's a 20% compared to 13-14. Uh, so in the green lines, we show where we've been at in 14-15. And the red line is that target if you were if you were going to go month to month to reach that 20%. So we're, you know, the latest data we have is in March. We're above the red line. So we've got to get down to that red line to meet that 20% target. Uh, the city itself, um, one of the things we've already done is we've stopped irrigating ornamental turf in medians. Um, we've turned, out, turned off the fountains at the city facilities, and we've done, even done some irrigation cutbacks at parks in areas where it's not actual turf that, say, people are playing on and using in that sense. Um, we're, we've got some funding from MWD to do turf removal at some of our sites, at GWP sites. Um, and we've spoken about this before, about um, Prop 84 grant funding and things like that for some of our recycled water main extensions to increase our recycled water system. Um, one of the important takeaways is a lot of the, the usage is outdoors. And this graph kind of shows um, basically single family versus multi-family usage and it's gallons per capita per day. So in a single family, it'd be around 150 estimate, whereas in multi-family, it's about 62 um, gallons per capita per day, which is really highlighting that it's the outdoor water use that's, that's really the target to help us get to that 20% reduction. Um, and then we've done our outreach activities. Even today, there was a press release um, discussing the, the resolution to go to phase three. Um, and then we have uh, some new outreach, like some new advertising, like on the bus stations, I think some things on the buses, and then maybe on some bridges and things like that, um, with just those messages about, uh, you know, there are going to be a lot of folks with brown blondes and, and things like that. So... And then our customers still are eligible for turf replacement rebates, um, other water smart, you know, water saving devices and rebates like that. Um, and of course, we have information available on the websites about water wise gardening and conservation. And, you know, if, if folks ask, what can I do? Um, we've got a lot of examples on our website. And then we've got our normal uh, water saving programs. Um, and that and that's kind of it for an update. Any any questions? So we have, as a, as Mike said, and we talked about earlier, we are in phase three, two days a week watering, and as Mike reiterated, it, it has really come down to this exterior irrigation. That is a big uh, user of water. With that comes 
other issues such as brown lawns and, and that type of thing. So um, that's something we need to be prepared for. We've, we've coordinated the um, code enforcement operation. So, so code enforcement for dying or dead vegetation lawns is being suspended during the mandatory phase of the conservation. Um, we greatly encourage folks to take that opportunity to maybe reduce their turf or, or, or eliminate it altogether, especially being able to take, care of, uh, take advantage of the uh, MWD program. But that's really where, where our focus is and where the focus of the, of the, uh, the state is, to be honest with you. Uh, there's been a couple comments made that if we focused greatly and reduced just the outside irrigation, we could make that 25% statewide without having to, to really look at a whole lot of, uh, more than that. As I've said to everybody that I've spoken about the drought to, I think our, our interior water use habits are pretty well defined. I think those, those from previous droughts, you, you know, either it's you or your children have gotten you um, to do things that, you know, to, to conserve on water, whether it's shorter showers or turning the water off when you brush your teeth. Um, the plumbing industry, they have made great strides in faucets, fixtures, and other things to keep the, the use of water to, to operate those down. Uh, washing machines, another huge water user. They, they've been, they're now very, very uh, energy efficient, water use efficient. So it, it still comes down to that, that outside irrigation. And I think if you look at the, the, you know, the discrepancy between what the goals were in the state, I think it's been as low as 8% for the Santa Cruz's and San Francisco's of the world, as high as 36% for, for uh, Beverly Hills and, and some of those, those other communities. You're, you're seeing that major difference. When you think about those two communities, it's, it's a lot of more landscaping in one than the other. I don't want to, I don't want to, to um, discredit their great efforts at conservation in San Francisco and Santa Cruz, but I mean, at the same time, you have a lot of urban living and, and a lot less of the of the exterior irrigation that you have here. So, plus you have a lot more rainfall there too. So you get you get that uh, what exterior uh, irrigation you would need is is a lot less. It's just much hotter here. So, so we really have a lot of focus on that, including ourselves. So, uh, as Mike indicated, for those, those major uh, turf meetings, because the governor's order specifically states you cannot water public right-of-way medians, especially street medians, with potable water. So, where we have recycled water in use, and we've done a good job there, Glen Oaks is the first one. Uh, that's the large median that we have there, Glendale Avenue. Uh, Brand Boulevard, those we can continue to, to irrigate. Others we've turned off, because we are not using potable water. So we've taken a lot of really quick actions and we're going to continue to hit this. As Mike said, we've got an outreach program that continues and continues from banners to bus stops to buses to uh, restaurants to windows to wherever we can get the word out and talk to people about conserving water, we will. So with that, if you have any questions. Let's have a quick few on. Now that's getting more serious, I mean, obviously there's going to be penalties. Are we, is, it, <clears throat> is the city doing anything to even be like a, the cop because we're relying on the citizens to call in and report right. waterways. Are we doing as a city to be the police of that as well? So, yeah, good question, Mr. Yeah. So we have, as, as we indicated to you when we gave you the report last month, have, have tried to use the education and information process to let people know that there is uh, the situation that we're in with the drought statewide and that our, our local laws prohibit certain watering times and days and that, that type of thing. For re repeat offenders, we've, we've taken a little stronger action, even have gone out and put door hangers on. But with, with the situation getting more severe, as you stated, and with fines of up to $10,000 that potentially could be levied against us by the state, there's a need for us to, to kind of ratchet up our enforcement as well. So that, that sort of education letter that went out before, and, and again, we're targeting egregious repeat offenders, folks who we, we know are just not complying. Uh, this is not the person who waters on a Wednesday and, and we go and, and remind them and they said, geez, I didn't even know. You know, that, that's going to happen. These are for repeat egregious offenders, and, and so we'll have warning letters that will go out first. Those will be legitimate warning letters. And then we have, are already coordinating with our code enforcement folks. So there's an infraction that can be anywhere from $100 to $1,000 levied against the individual who continues to violate the law. Um, and we're looking at uh, being able to do it administratively as well, which will allow water and power employees who are out in the field uh, make those uh, contacts as well with folks that we see violating 
either the uh, the days, the times, or the times during the day. So with the uh, two days a week watering, is the expectation that most of the lawns would turn brown because two days with 10 minutes, is it possible to maintain a green lawn? It's, it depends on what kind of lawn you have, Mr. Yao, to be honest with you. You know, all, um, m most of the lawns require a pretty, pretty consistent amount of water, but there are some lawns that can do better than others without, with, with, a, with a limited amount of water. Uh, keep in mind that we're talking about uh, irrigation systems. So you still have the ability to install drip irrigation and bubbler units where you aren't. You're still required to, you can only use uh, water during those two days, but you can water longer. And if you want to water your lawn with a hose and a shutoff nozzle, you can water, again, only on the two days, Tuesday and Thursday, but you can water longer. You're not restricted by the 10 minutes. A 10 minutes restriction per station is specifically for a timer station, irrigation timer station. So there is a potential, it's a little more effort, a little more work if you want to get out and put some more water on your property to keep it, to keep it green, you, you can do the hand watering or the, uh, the more efficient drip systems. Because I was getting at if you see a green lawn, does that sort of indicate you or alert the city that potentially there could be some water waste? It could, <laughs> not in and of itself, but I mean if you saw somebody whose lush, beautiful, tall fescue grass doesn't look like it has suffered at all, it's probably a good indication that there might be some, some uh, uh, excess watering going on and we are working with the city attorney's office to see if we see something like that how can we use the metering system to verify uh, what's going on and, and, and how if, it, if we at all we can use that as some sort of an enforcement mechanism as well okay um, at the risk of uh, touching a third rail issue here um, is there, does the city have any ordinance or, or have a policy to supersede any HOA kinds of agreements that would prevent someone from doing a turf replacement or putting in a different, you know, water conservation lawn? Our turf, and I'll let Christine give you the, the, the nitty gritty legal. In our turf replacement, you may recall, there are zoning requirements for vegetation and that's what, when anybody who applies for us, we, we suggest, strongly suggest that you, you touch base with zoning to make sure that in your turf replacement program you are adhering to whatever rules and regulations are there, you know, about what percentage of landscaping is required and how that, how that works out. So we've, we've continued yeah, to... The zoning is a slightly separate issue because the, the, you, can, you can still be in a zone where it would be appropriate to do uh, a you know, turf replacement, but you're precluded because of a private agreement as part of your homeowners association or something like that. This is affecting other jurisdictions a little bit more intensely, probably than here. I know that we do. I haven't heard of that issue yeah. in Glendale, but that's an, that's an interesting angle, and that's something we definitely need to explore and take a look at if that is, in fact, the case. Uh, it's, it's purely a curiosity. I don't know if we so have The CCNRs or the Homeowners Association yeah. supersedes the ability of the city to... Well, the, the HOA wouldn't supersede the ability of the city, city to regulate it, city. but, but we, in the absence of an ordinance which would allow for a turf replacement to go in, it's, it, we might need to change the, the law huh. to override those HOA we'll agreements. Take a look at that. Kinds of take a look at that. So I, yeah, I, I know there's pretty... <coughs> HOAs can be pretty strict in how the exterior of your property is maintained and uh, very interesting I hadn't heard that one but on that note we are working with building and safety with engineering with zoning to see if there are any further changes to other codes that are being uh, impacted by water conservation and mandatory uh, measures to see if there's ways that we can help the consumer or tighten up the conservation ordinance so that those talks continue Okay, thank you so much for the update. Uh, next item, please. Five is oral communications. Discussion is limited to items not part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes or three minutes. Commission may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. The general manager may refer to the matter appropriate staff for investigation and report. We don't have any, correct? Okay, um, next item. Six, agenda forecast. Okay. Uh, but did you meant, um, was there something that was mentioned earlier? Yeah, um, I mentioned that since the budget is going to be presented to the City Council on June 2nd. That's right. That since our June 1st meeting, we can get a chance to review the budget again and look at the reserve that Commissioner Hale has suggested to and be included. And then any 
updated budgets item that staff has, we can take a look at it too. Yeah, I'll put the update on there. So okay. if anything has changed, and then I'll give you the, we'll send you out those reserve. That sounds good. Those reserve numbers. Let me point out the last bullet on electrical storage because you heard our consultant tell you he's still got, that's something that we did not separately, but we did it later in the process. So he's got some more work to do. I don't think we're going to be able to get to you by June, so we'll push that a month. Okay. And that's separate than the, uh, the ice storage? Ice is part of it. Okay. It's all storage. It's either, you know, I mean, ice is one concept in storage. Batteries is another concept. Uh, the other thing is, um, let me write budget update. The capital improvement projects update would be a look at what we are currently budgeted for and an update on where those are. So you'll be able to see that overlap. You yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Is that just water or electric or both? Both. Uh, and power uh, as well. Well, the question I had for you, if it's your desire, because me and the first, the second, we can bring back an action item for you to make a recommendation on the IRP if you'd like. I had actually do it. So I'll carry that. If you want to do that and you make a recommendation, I can carry that to the next night mm -hmm. at the second, the meeting of the second. Sure. I had a request. I don't know if anybody else is interested, but uh, specifically what, the, what our previous speaker said about time of use, and I don't know where we are with that, and, but I would be interested in learning more about that and how that impacts overall capacity. Sure. Uh, I think Probably do distributed generation at the same time because, like I said, those are two hot topics and we can okay. go through yeah. both those. So. Yeah. But back to, would you like me to bring an action item for you on the IRP? Well, I think that will kind of uh, affect the total or the overall IRP, if, or it, it may not, I don't know. It, uh, yeah, we won't have anything. I mean, what we have on, on, yeah. on that is, is what's included in the plan now. Um, there, is, there may be opportunities for us to do some things in the interim. Um, but that's the, the, the time of use is what we had is built into the IRP that goes in with the, the recommendation. I, I think it's a good idea. I mean, if you bring it in, yeah. if we discuss it. I mean, it. we're going to go to council yeah. the next next yeah. night if you'd like for me to carry a recommendation yeah. from you. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd, I'd very much like to see an action item, and, and I'd like to see what, what the staff's consensus is based on the, the PACE Global review uh, of what, what the, sure, what the we'll recommendation would be. Sure, so. we'll put that in the report, what our recommendation is. So we'll just make sure we have a resolution, I guess, or a motion. We'll put something together, likely a motion. Okay, okay. sounds good. Um, okay, so it looks like we have, quite, uh, we have quite a few items already for June 1st, uh, July 6th as well. So all these still look valid? Yes, mm -hmm, um, they do. Uh, so we'll keep those on here, and if anything comes up again, I'm, I don't know where electrical storage is going to fall. Let me get a better idea of when these gentlemen are going to be finished so we have something more comprehensive for you. Sure. So I won't write that in any one place just yet, uh, <coughs> but everything else I think is, is going to be going to be okay depending on uh, if we finish everything on time so if not sure. I'll update you okay the sounds next good time we meet. Seven. any other I just have a quick question on uh, the gen the forecast it's not maybe part of gen in the future but any feeling on appointments of new commissioners or reappointments of the process yeah, and, and, you, and you know mr. yeah that's all that's all the the council's decision so I believe that is tomorrow night or next Tuesday um, I, I'm not sure which of the agendas, but on an upcoming agenda, I know there's something agendized with regard to appointments, but how quickly that process will play out, I'm not sure. Correct. So both of the two new council members, two, two uh, <coughs> elected, two newly elected council members, have the opportunity to um, reevaluate all of their commission appointments. So the agenda, and again, I, I'm with Christine, I don't know if it's tomorrow or if it's the following Tuesday, for, for Mr. Garapetian and Ms. Devine. Will have all of their their uh, commission appointments up for discussion. Now that discussion may mean that they want to advertise for it. They may want to reappoint somebody right away. We don't know. So as Christine said, it could happen in some cases or in all cases that night, or it may be uh, later on. So the process is we still show up until we hear otherwise. That that's absolutely, correct. you would continue to stay on as commissioners until you're re replaced, or maybe you know continue on even after that. So we'll see how it plays out. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, do I have a motion for adjournment? Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay.
Okay. I'll say aye. 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 Okay. aye. Meetings adjourned. Thank you very much.